Hi, welcome to How to Make an App for Beginners. If you've ever thought about building your own app, this is the video for you. By the end of this video, you will have built your very first app. Watch all 10 videos and you will have built these apps. Building these apps will teach you how to build your app's user interface, how to add graphics, text, and even buttons to your app, how to respond to user interaction, how to make sure your layout works on multiple screen sizes and orientations. Finally, I'll show you how to install that app on your device so that you can show all of your friends and family the app that you've built. I'm Chris Chang, the founder of Code with Chris, where beginners go to learn how to make an app with no programming experience. Building an app is simple. There are only two things you need to know. The first thing is Xcode. This is the application you build apps with. It's free. Use it to construct your app's user interface, as well as to write code to respond to user interaction and to express logic. The code that we write follows a certain structure or syntax, and this brings me to the second thing that you have to learn, the Swift programming language. To give you an example of how these two things work together, imagine you had to write an English essay. In this case, Swift would be the English language, and Xcode would be your pen and paper. Now here's the nice thing about learning Xcode and Swift. These are the same tools you're going to use for everything in the Apple ecosystem. You're going to be able to build iPad and iPhone apps, iOS games, Apple Watch apps, Apple TV apps, and apps for Mac. Now that we know what we need to learn, let's dive right in. First, let's download Xcode. If you're using Windows, check the description below for my guide on how to use Xcode on Windows. If you're on a Mac, just go to the Mac App Store and download it for free. I'm going to warn you though, you will probably need the latest Mac OS and a whole lot of free disk space. Once you've got it installed, launch the app and click on Start a New Xcode Project. Across the top of the next screen, you'll see templates for all of the different platforms we mentioned earlier. Make sure you're on the iOS tab and choose a Single View App. Click Next. Here, you're going to be able to specify some properties for your project. For the product name, you can just type a name for your app. I'll just call this App1. You can leave Team as is. For organization name, you can put your own name in there. And for the organization identifier, just put com dot either your name or your company name. And together with the product name, that's going to form an identifier for your app. Important thing is for the language, make sure you have Swift selected and you can unselect all of these options down here. Click next. Choose a place to save your project. You can leave source control unchecked and then click create. Say hello to your new project. Now this might look intimidating, but it's really not. Let me walk you through it. At the end of this video, I'll show you where you can download my Xcode cheat sheet. On the left hand side, you have your navigator area. What's shown here is the file navigator where you can see all the files in your project. Each tab at the top is a different navigator type, but leave it at the file navigator for now because you'll be using this most often. If you select a file from your file navigator, it will change what's shown here in the editor area. The interface changes depending on what sort of file you choose. For example, choosing this project file will let you configure the project properties while selecting a code file will let you write Swift code in the editor area. Furthermore, choosing the storyboard file is going to let you customize the user interface for your app. On the right hand side, you're going to find the utility area. This panel is split into two panes. The inspector pane is the top one and it'll show you information and configurable properties for the file or user interface element you click on. The bottom pane of the utility area is called the library pane and this contains lists of reusable code snippets and user interface elements that we can add to our project. Finally, along the top, you have the Xcode toolbar. This gives you the controls to run your project. It shows you the status of your project, and on the right-hand side, buttons to hide or show the various parts of the Xcode interface we just talked about. Let's try to run our project. Xcode comes with an iOS simulator, which lets you run and test your app without needing a physical iOS device. Yeah. Let's choose a simulator from the toolbar, and then click the big play button here. It might take a few minutes for the first time it runs, but this is going to launch the simulator and you'll see your app running. If the simulator is too big on your screen, you can go up here to the window menu and go under scale and change the scaling of the device to fit your screen. You can also hit on your keyboard command 1, command 2, and command 3. It's just a white screen now, sadly, but that's because we haven't added anything to it. 
Now, how did that Xcode project turn into this app that you're seeing in the simulator? Let's break it down. This top layer is called the view. It's the user interface that the user sees. You can configure this from the main.storyboard file in your Xcode project. The second layer is the view controller. This code file's responsibility is to manage the view. For instance, when the user taps on the view, it will let the view controller know. And then you can write the code that you want to run when this happens. This view controller is represented by the viewcontroller.swift file in your Xcode project. If you click it, the editor area turns into the code editor where you can write Swift code to manage the view. So back in our Xcode project, hit this stop icon here to stop running your project. If we want to display something on the screen, we have to add some elements to the view in our storyboard. So go ahead and click on main.storyboard here and the editor area will turn into interface builder. And in the library pane, that's this guy down here, make sure you're looking at the object library tab. Then in the filter box, type in label. That's going to show us the label element. Then simply click and drag that element and drop it into our view. We're not finished yet because we haven't positioned the label on our screen. Xcode uses a system called Auto Layout to size and position the elements on the screen. This makes it easier for you to build layouts that work on multiple screen sizes and orientations. Basically, you specify rules that dictate how your elements should be positioned and how they should be sized. Rules such as, this element should be the same height as another element, or this element should be 20 points away from the right side. These rules are called auto layout constraints. Now you're going to learn a lot more about auto layout in the next lesson, but for now, let's jump back into Xcode and position our label. Now after you added your label, you might have noticed that it also showed up here. This area is called the document outline and it lists all the elements you have in your view. If you don't have this window, click this little icon here to show and hide it. Let's center our label in the screen by adding some constraints to it. Click on the label from your document outline to select it. And then down in the lower corner, we have these little icons. If you hover over them, you'll see their names. Click on the align icon and out pops this menu. Choose the horizontally in container and vertically in container and then click this button that says add to constraints. And then you'll see the label reposition itself based on the newly added constraints. Now let's change the text on the label. With your label selected, you should see its configurable properties in the inspector pane on the right hand side. Make sure you're looking at the correct tab. And then scroll to find the text property. It should be the first one. And then just erase that label in there and type in hello world. Now let's run the project in our simulator again. Click this little run icon here. And then you should see this. Congratulations, you've built your very first app. Today, you got a tour of the Xcode development environment. You learned about the view, which is what the user sees, and the view controller, whose job it is to manage that view. You learned that you can customize that view in the main.storyboard file in your Xcode project. You also learned that the view controller is represented by the viewcontroller.swift file in your Xcode project. All of this is in my Xcode cheat sheet, and it's free for you to download. But first, if you like this video, please subscribe to my channel by clicking the subscribe button below. And if you don't want to miss a single video, click that bell icon as well. Now I want to turn it over to you. With the skills that you're going to learn, are you going to build an app or are you going to build a game? Let me know by leaving a quick comment below. And lastly, I promised you guys my Xcode cheat sheet. Just follow the URL on screen or the URL in the description below to download it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next lesson. <laughs> the video broke up, so I have to press record again. Hi, welcome to lesson two. In this video, you're going to learn how to build your app's user interface. And that's just the technical term for the screen that the user sees. You'll learn about auto layout that's used to position and size elements. By the end of this video, you'll have built this user interface. As you can see, you're going to learn how to add images, text, and how to position them. More importantly, you're going to be doing it with auto layout constraints. And you're going to learn how to do it in a way that's going to make it work for all screen sizes. So we're just going to start a brand new Xcode project, just like we did in the previous lesson. Make sure you're looking under this iOS tab 
and that you've got single view app selected. Let's click next. And then in the product name, I'm going to say app two and the rest of the properties should already be filled out from the project you created from the last lesson. We don't need to change any of that. Let's so click next. And then we are just going to save it on the desktop. We're going to jump right into the main dot storyboard here because we're going to start customizing our view in the lower right hand corner. Do you remember what this is called? This is the library pane and we're going to be looking at this tab, the object library. This is where we are going to be able to select some elements to add into our view. So in this filter text box, I'm going to type in image view because this is the element we're going to use to display images in our screen. So let's click and drag and then drop that into our view. Unfortunately, right now we don't have any images to show in that image view. We have to actually add those images into our Xcode project. So if you look in the file navigator here on the left hand side, right underneath the main.storyboard, you'll see this assets.xc assets. If you click that, it's going to bring you to a section where we store the images that we use for our project. As expected, there's nothing right here. And in fact, there's even an entry for the app icon, but there are no image assets here. So what we're going to want to do is add some images in here for us to use. And if you check the description below this video, I've got a link to the image that we're going to use in this project. It's called uh, lesson two assets dot zip. So just click that link right now, download that zip file and put it on your desktop. And then I want you to go ahead and unzip that file. I'm going to double click this zip file and it's going to unpack it and out pops an image. This is the image we're going to use. So all you have to do is click this image and drag it into your Xcode project. And you should have highlighted the assets.xe assets so you can drag it directly into this asset library. You can either put it in this panel or this panel, it really doesn't matter. But when you let go of your mouse button, you're going to have this image in your Xcode project now. What we're going to want to do is actually rename this asset and I'm going to click it and wait about a second. It's going to open up a text box for us to rename it and then put landscape in there. Alternatively, you can actually highlight it and just hit enter on your keyboard and that allows you to rename it as well. So right now you should be looking at your assets.xc assets. You should have this landscape entry and you should see this image here. Let's go back to main.storyboard and now in this image view, just highlight it in the document outline and right here in the inspector pane we're looking at the attributes inspector at the very top there is this image property pull the drop down down and you're going to see that image asset which we added so just click that and then immediately you're going to see your image view display that image now we're going to want this guy to be full screen so we're going to need to set some constraints for this UI image view. But first, I want to show you something called the safe area in this document outline. If you go ahead and click that, you're going to see a portion of your view highlighted in blue. And this is what is known as the safe area. You can see this little bar at the top in white. That's not part of the safe area. And the safe area is just a space where you can be guaranteed that the stuff you add won't be obstructed. So as you can tell, up here, this is where the status bar for the phone is, right? You see your time, you see the carrier, you see, you know, a bunch of icons and stuff like that. So it's just warning you, you know, if you highlight the safe area that the area highlighted in blue is an area where your elements won't get obstructed. Now that doesn't mean that you can't put anything up here. I mean, we can go ahead and stretch that image all the way to the very top. We just have to understand that there may be some text overlaying that like the carrier, the time, the symbols and such. So this is going to come into play because when we add auto layout constraints, we can specify, do we want that constraint? Like for instance, if we're specifying a top margin for this element, do we want that to be zero from the safe area or do we want it to be zero from the very edge of the screen? All right? So I'm going to show you that right now. We're going to highlight the UI image view and then we're going to go down here to the bottom right and we're going to click this add new constraints button and this menu pops up. It's going to allow us to add some margin constraints 
for our UI image view. You can see four text boxes here, one on each side, and each of these text boxes represents the margin that we want to set for that UI image view. Right here, there are some default numbers, and these numbers are just the current values if we wanted to have the UI image view look like this. So you can see 235 here. Right now, this length right here is 235. So we're gonna go ahead and change this to zero. Oh, and I should mention that the values you see here will be different because when you drag that UI image view into the view, you'll probably have dropped it in a different place than I have. So where I dropped it into the view, these are the current margins. So I've set this to one to zero. You can see that this constraint is active or I'm about to add it because this red line is highlighted. Now the other three margin lines are blanked out. And down here you can see add one constraint. If I change the number, it kind of automatically activates that constraint. And you can see down here it says add two constraints now. If I click this button right now, it's going to add this top constraint and this left constraint. Now I can actually click that and turn it on or off. Right now I'm not adding any constraints and right now I'm adding two constraints. Another thing I wanna mention is this little uh, triangle here. These aren't actually text boxes, they're actually drop downs. So if I click this, you're going to see the safe area in the view. This is what I was mentioning before. Do we want it to be zero margin from the safe area or from the view? So I'm actually gonna change this to the view like that. And be careful because it changes back to 235 when I select that. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit zero again. So even for these ones, I'm gonna change it from safe area to the view to make sure it's actually to the very edge of the screen. This one, again, change it to the view. And this one down here, I'm gonna change it to the view. And then I'm gonna set all of these to zero. So a fast way to jump through the different text boxes is if you just press tab like that. And then lastly, we're going to uncheck constraint to margins because we want it to be to the very edge and not towards some margin. And then down here, it should say add four constraints. So click that and immediately you're going to see that UI image view stretch to all four edges. Now it doesn't go all the way to the top. I'm going to double check what we added there. If you look in the document outline, you'll see that now you have this entry called constraints. If we expand that, you can see the four constraints which we added. And clicking each of them, you can look in the inspector pane on the right hand side and you can look at some configurable properties for it. So let's take a look at the top one, landscape top equals. So somehow, even though I set it to the view, somehow it's changed itself back to the safe area. So what we can do, actually before I do that, let me explain to you what this means. So this constraint is saying to make the landscape. Landscape is our image view, right? The top edge of our image view equal to the top edge of the safe area, right? And zero, this is what we specified, but I don't want it to be zero from the safe area. I actually want it to be zero from the view up here. So I'm gonna pull this drop down, down, and I'm going to choose super view. And super view is just a term to describe the view that contains our UI image view. So let's click on super view. And then you can see that this constant has changed to 20. And you can see that there is this bar here, this constraint that's indicating that my UI image view is now 20 from the super view dot top. Well, I'm gonna change that back to zero, hit enter. And now you can see that it's actually zero from the very, very top instead of the safe area. So I've just showed you that you can click on a constraint and you can edit it from this inspector panel. Now I wanna show you that you can actually just remove them. So if you make a mistake, go ahead into this document outline right here. Uh, you can hold down command or shift and you can click each of them like this and then just go ahead and hit delete on your keyboard. If we do that, this image view, it looks like it's positioned correctly, but in reality, there are no constraints dictating how it should be positioned or sized. So that's gonna be a problem. We've just deleted all of our constraints. As extra practice, we're gonna just re-add them. So let's click on the landscape right here, this UI image view that is now named landscape, I mean. And then go down here to the bottom right and go to add new constraints. And we're gonna do this again. So first of all, it looks like this one is safe area. So I'm gonna choose view. This one 
safe here. I'm gonna select view instead. This one I'm gonna select view. This one is view, okay. And let's double check that it hasn't changed on me again. <laughs> and let's click add four constraints. So there we go, we have four again. All right, the next thing is that this image actually looks kind of stretched and it looks distorted, right? If we highlight the image view here and go into the inspector panel, there is a property called content mode and this dictates how the image should be stretched or if it should not be stretched. Right now it's set to scale to fill, which means it's just going to stretch it however it needs to in order to fill up the whole image view. For instance, we can set it to just center and it's just not going to stretch it and there's actually a lot of overlap that you can't see right now. Or we can set it to aspect fit. It's just going to try and fit the entire image without stretching it. Or we can set it to aspect fill. It's going to enlarge it so that it fills the entire image view but it's not going to distort it because it's going to maintain the same uh, height and width ratio so that it won't look squished or stretched or anything like that. So that's the one we're going to choose. So then we get something that looks like this. All right, now we have to add our labels, but we can't just add our labels here because that text is going to be pretty hard to read. So we're going to create a little bit of a black background here um, so that we can put our labels on top of it and then it'll be easier to read. So down here in the object library, let's change this filter text instead of uh, image view, let's type in UI view. When you do that, you're going to see this element here that says view. So this is kind of like a generic view that we can color and we can put things in. We're going to go ahead and click that and drag that onto our screen just like that. And having it highlighted in this document outline, I'm going to go over to the inspector pane. We're going to change the background color. So go ahead, hit this drop down and choose black color. And then you're going to click this little black uh, rectangle here. That's going to bring up this little menu with a couple of tabs. If you choose this tab here, it's going to be all black, but you can slide this opacity and you can make it semi opaque like that. And I'm going to set to about 80%. You can also just type it into this text box here. And then we're going to go ahead and click that red X to close it. And you can see that we have this beautiful sort of semi-transparent black, which we're going to put our labels on top of. But first, let's position this um, UI view. So having it highlighted in our document outline, I'm going to go over here and click Add New Constraints. I'm going to just off the bat uncheck constraint to margins and I'm going to go ahead and enable the left, the right and the bottom uh, constraints and then I'm going to choose view instead of safe area like that and change that and then I'm going to set these to zero. Notice that I'm not touching this top constraint and I'll show you why in a second. So I'm going to do zero, I'm going to do zero, I'm going to do zero. Well, let me just double check that it hasn't changed back to the safe area. All right and we're going to click add three constraints this time all right so you you're going to see a couple of things here first of all it's stretched to the left and right because we added those constraints but now there's this red line here and it's supposed to stick to the bottom because we said it should be zero from the bottom but there's this red line here and over on the document outline you can see this little red arrow here if we click that you're going to see that there are some auto layout errors Right here, it says that it's missing some constraints. It can't determine the Y position or the height. So before our bottom constraint is going to take effect, we're going to need to set either a height for this view or a top constraint so that auto layout system has all the information it needs to be able to position that UI view. So what we're going to do is highlight this view while holding down the command key click on this root view as well. This is kind of like the the overall view that contains everything. So, okay, let me try that again. So highlight this view, hold down command, and then click this root view. So you should have both of these highlighted in blue now. Now with that, I want to go down here, add new constraints again, and I want you to choose equal heights. And that is going to basically make this black dimmed view the same height as the root view 
which basically is this entire view right here. But we're going to do a little something special in order to make it dynamic. So you're going to see that in a second. But for now, make sure you have equal heights checked on and then click add one constraint. Then you're going to see basically the whole thing dimmed out um, and then a couple more constraints added in this constraints menu. You can see that it's starting to get pretty confusing. I can't really tell unless I really, really try to read it. I can't really tell which constraints have to do with the landscape and which constraints have to do with this view, right? So one easy way to tell, if I only care about the constraints for this UI view, for instance, let's highlight it in the document outline here. And then I'm going to go into the size inspector tab. And if I scroll down, it actually shows me that there are four constraints that relate to this element. And like this, I can easily tell which constraints that I want to modify. So I actually want to modify this one equal height to super view. I'm going to double click it. Well, it's automatically going to highlight the constraint that I selected. And then it's going to show me its configurable properties here on the inspector pane. So let me read this constraint to you. The views height should be equal to the super views height. So this is the view and this is the super view. Remember, super view is just a fancy word for the view that contains that element. So you can see that if I collapse this view, everything is inside of it, right? So this view actually contains everything inside of it. All right, so if you have this reversed, if you have super view dot height is equal to view dot height, I want you to go down here and click on reverse first and second item. If I click that, you're gonna see super view height equal view height. I don't want that. I want you to click this reverse first and second item. The first item should be view height because that's what you're trying to specify. So our rule states that the views height should be equal to the super views height. And down here, there's a multiplier. I want to change this to 0 0.3. When I do that, that's saying that the views height should be equal to 0 0.3 times the super views height. And this is going to set the height so that it's about a third or about 30% of the entire height. And this is going to be dynamic. It doesn't matter how tall the root view is, it's always going to be 30% of that height. All right, now in the bottom right hand corner, let's change this UI view filter text. Let's type in label because we're about to add some labels. And let's click and let's drag this into this black area, this UI view. When you do that, you can see that my label is actually inside of this UI view now because this UI view is actually a container view. It can contain other elements. And now that my label is inside that view, when I specify my auto layout constraints, let's say I want it to be uh, zero from the top, it's going to be zero from the top of this UI view. It's not going to be zero from the top of this root view, right? Because you're always specifying the positioning constraints relative to the parent that contains it. Right, so since this view contains my label, if I position my label zero from the top, it's going to be based on the top of this view, which is fine. That's exactly what I want. So let's highlight this label in the document outline. Let's go into the attributes inspector here. First of all, let's change the color so we can actually read it. We're going to choose white color and let's change the label to city by the sea. And don't worry that it's kind of cut off right now. We're going to address that. And then I'm going to click this little icon here so we can change it to a bold type of font. And I'm just going to up the size to something like 24. And then we're going to specify some auto layout constraints for this guy. So with this label highlighted, I'm going to go down here to add constraints. And we are going to, let's do those constraints, the top, the left, and the right. So for the top, I'm going to say 20. From the left, I'm going to say 20. And from the right, I'm going to say 20 as well. And then we're going to click Add Three Constraints. And then you're going to see something like this. We're going to add a little description label below that. So let's click this label and let's pop it into there as well. And now you can see in this document outline that my view contains two labels. So highlight this second label. Let's configure some properties. Let's change it to white. Let's change the font. We'll leave it at 17. And we're going to set some constraints for this guy. So make sure it's highlighted here. 
and then click on add new constraints down here and this time we are going to uh, again we're going to do that but if you pull this drop down down you're going to see that you can position it relative to the label that's directly above it so we're going to choose that we're not going to choose the view so position it relative to the element that's right above it and i'm going to say that it should be 10 points below that title label the left will be 20 and the right will be 20 as well and then i'm going to add these three constraints you're going to see something like that now i'm going to go back to these properties um, there are a couple things i forgot to set for example i want to type a sentence so this is such a beautiful place and if we wanted to make it multi-line all we have to do down here is change that uh, lines by default it's one let's change it to zero and if i typed more text it's going to be multi-line but i'm going to leave it like that for now now that we've created this beautiful layout we're going to preview it in different screen sizes and orientations and the way we do that you might have noticed down here it says view as iphone 8. if i click this I bring it up you can actually see a whole bunch of different screen sizes and orientations so the one i'm looking at right now is iphone 8 but you can go up so let's say click this this is the iphone x sometimes um, if you don't see this entire view or some of if it's blocked out or maybe it's the screen is all white try zooming in and then zooming out to force that view to kind of refresh and redraw itself now let's go up again this is the iPhone 8 Plus. So you see here I have a white screen. I'm just going to click and zoom in. So you see now it's just redrawn. If you don't have these controls here, it may be that the, you're maybe on a laptop screen and you can't see this. You need to make a little more space. Click this document outline button to just hide the document outline and you'll probably get your zoom buttons down here. All right, so let's go downwards now. So we were looking at the iPhone 8. That's where we started. Let's go downwards. This is the iPhone SE, and this is the iPhone 4S. Now we're going to change the orientation. We're going to click on Landscape here. So you can see that everything's adapted itself because all of our constraints are dynamic. And you can see that this still takes up a 30% of the height of the screen. We're going to go upwards. This is the iPhone SE, iPhone 8 the iPhone 10 and again part of it is cropped let's go like that so you can see that here it's kind of a little bit almost touching our text label here now if we had specified that uh, the left side of the UI image view and the UI view should be relative to the safe area and not to the very edge then we wouldn't have come into this notch area actually this part right here this part's considered a safe area let me see if i yeah if i click on safe area right here you can see a blue outline you can see that this left edge of the screen this is not in the safe area and you can see that this part is not in the safe area and also this part down here is not in the safe area. Since we kind of ignored the safe area and we specified our elements to the very edges, that's why this text is so close to here. In order to fix this, we might just increase the margin on the left side or something like that. All right, let's move on. Let's go to the next device. We've got the 8 Plus again. I have this white screen. Let's zoom out, zoom in. So there you go. Now, one thing I ought to mention is that this area down here lets you preview your layout in multiple screen sizes or orientations but it also allows you to add constraints that are specific to a certain screen size and the way you do that is this button here vary for constraints if you accidentally click this and then let's say you clicked something like that and then this area became blue then you're actually at this point you're going to be adding constraints that are specific to this right here and you're not actually specifying constraints to be specific to a screen size but there's something called size classes which each size class actually contains a bunch of different screen sizes it's like a category of screen sizes this is something that we'll cover down the line i want to warn you about it right now be just in case 
uh, this area looks blue for you. If it does, you have to click on this done varying and chances are the constraints that you added were specific to whatever screen size you accidentally selected. So I would at this point advise you um, after you you clicked on done varying, if you had accidentally clicked it before, is to now go ahead and delete all your constraints and kind of redo it and re-add it. But for most of you, if you didn't click this button before and you didn't know about it or you didn't notice it um, and it's not blue, chances are you don't have anything to worry about. So now I'm going to run it in the simulator. So I'm going to go ahead and select the iPhone 8 simulator. I'm going to click run. I'm going to see it launch in our simulator. Just like that. And in order to rotate the device, you can go up to hardware. Uh, you can go down to rotate left or rotate right. And as you can see, there are shortcut keys. You can hold down command and press the left arrow or right arrow. Uh, you can actually even just choose one like this from here, orientation. But I'm going to use the shortcut keys. So on my keyboard, let's press command and left. You can see that it's just rotated. I rotate it back, rotate it the other way now. So there you have it. Today you learned about auto layout and what the safe area is. You learned how to add, edit, and delete constraints. You also learned how to check your layout under different screen sizes and orientations. Now how would you like to get some extra practice and build another user interface? I've got a worksheet for you to do just that. Go through it and build this user interface. First, I've got a question for you. For the app that you want to build, are you going to be focused on the iPad screen size or the iPhone screen size? Let me know by leaving a quick comment below. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel by clicking the subscribe button below. And if you don't want to miss a single video, make sure you click that bell icon as well. Lastly, don't forget to grab that worksheet and get some extra practice with auto layout. Just follow the URL on the screen or click on the URL in the description below the video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, welcome to lesson three of 10. In the previous lesson, you learned about auto layout and auto layout constraints. In this video, you're going to learn about stack views and how they're going to help you position elements while drastically cutting down on the number of auto layout constraints that you need to set. By the end of this video, you're going to have built this user interface. If you went through the lesson two worksheet, you might have noticed that this is what you built. However, you're going to see that by using stack views, you're going to be able to build this layout much easier and much faster. Let's start a brand new Xcode project. Make sure you're looking at iOS and choose single view app. Let's click next. I'm going to call this app three and all of these details should be the same. Language should be Swift. Let's click next. And I'm just going to save it on my desktop here, right here where the project configuration screen is because we've got this node highlighted. Scroll down to deployment info and under device orientation, we're going to uncheck portrait and just have landscape left and landscape right because this UI is going to be a landscape view. Let's go into the storyboard and we're going to click view as, and let's just change it to landscape orientation more so that we can visualize what we are actually building here. Um, the next thing I want to do is let's click on the asset library right here, and we're going to import the images for our Xcode project. Now I've provided a link in the description below to download these assets. The zip file is called lesson three assets. So I want you to go ahead and click that link, download it. I've got it already downloaded on my desktop here, and I'm just going to double click it to unzip it. It's going to open up a folder inside. You're going to find three images. What I want you to do is just highlight all three. You can press command a uh, to highlight everything, and then you can drag it either in here or in here. Right, so on the right hand side, I'm going to have burger, burrito, and salmon. These are properly named already, so you don't need to change any of the assets names. And then let's go into main.storyboard. And what we're going to start with today is a stack view. So let's go down here in the lower right hand corner, looking at the object library, type in stack view into the filter box. And there are two types horizontal stack view and vertical stack view. So these icons might confuse you a little bit, but a horizontal stack view 
basically stacks things in a horizontal fashion. So the first item you add will be on the left, second item will be to the right of that, third item will be to the right of that one, and so on and so forth. For vertical stack view, when you add an item that's going to be at the top, second item you add is going to be put below it, and then you know so on and so forth. So a vertical stack view stacks things vertically, while a horizontal stack view aligns all of your elements horizontally beside each other. So we're going to choose vertical stack view. I'm just going to put it right there. And then let's change that filter text to a label. I'm just going to drag a label into the stack view. You'll notice that right here um, in this document outline, you have a label inside of the stack view. See, I can collapse the stack view and the label is inside of it. All right, so the stack view actually contains the label. Um, you're going to see a bunch of red lines here because we haven't actually positioned the stack view. And we need to add a second element just to illustrate how the stack view works. So let's type in image view in here. Rather than dragging it onto the view here, you can actually just drag it directly into the stack view in the document outline. So you can see here, I've got the image view inside the stack view now. If I close the stack view, the image view and the label disappear. They're inside of it. And you can see here in the storyboard that our UI image view and label are stacked on top of each other, right, inside the stack view. Um, I want the label to actually be on top of the stack view. So in this document outline, I'm just going to click and drag and rearrange these two elements so that the label is above the image view. So you see here? Now here's the cool thing. With this stack view element right here, let me just highlight it and go over on the right hand side. I can change the orientation whenever I want. So even though I added a vertical stack view onto my view, I can change it to a horizontal stack view. So let me just do that. And you can see if I do that, it's just going to position them side by side like that. And there is also a spacing property that I can set. If I just put 20 there, it's going to space it out. Uh, so that it has a 20 point gap between each of the elements and I can keep adding elements into my stack view and it's going to place it side by side. No need to add any sort of auto layout constraints. Okay. So let me flip it back to vertical here. Now let's talk about some of the other things that we can set for a stack view. If I click on this alignment drop down, you're going to see that by default, it's set to fill. I can set it to leading center or trailing. And if I set it to center, it's basically going to center all of the elements down the middle. And if I click on leading, it's going to left align all the elements inside of it. Trailing is right align and fill basically tries to stretch it out so that it fills up the entire stack view. And this is the setting by default. So if I choose center, you're going to see that label become uh, center aligned. So let's choose that. You can see that is center aligned. Now the image view is still like this because there really isn't any sort of inherent width to it. Once we do set an image, depending on that size of the image, you might see it centered. If it's very big, you might see it fill up the entire width. All right. So what I want to do next is we're going to want to create another two of these things. So let's add another image view there. And I'm actually going to make this one a little skinnier so that I can fit another one there. And I can just resize that a little bit so that we can just fit it into the view. Then we're going to choose a label, drag it, put it approximately above each of those image views. And you see how this guy is inside of a stack view, right in the document outline. And we did this by adding a stack view first onto our view. And then we added the elements inside of the stack view. This time, because we have our elements already on the screen, I'm going to show you how to put existing elements into a stack view. There's actually a button to do that. So I'm going to highlight this UI image view. I'm going to hold down command and I'm going to click this label so that they're both highlighted. If I wanted to place these two elements into their own stack view, I first have to select them like I have. And then I go down here and click this button, embed in stack view. And when I click that, it automatically takes those two elements and puts them inside of a stack view. 
Now it's going to choose a vertical or a horizontal stack view depending on how they're already positioned. But it really doesn't matter because you can always just change the axis from the stack view property. So by default, Xcode chose to put it in the vertical stack view, which is what I wanted. Let's do the same thing with these two. Click on the UI image view, hold down command on your keyboard, and then click this so that you can multi-select both of them. And then let's go and click this button to put that in a vertical stack view. So now at this point, if you look over on the left hand side, we have three stack views. And if you pop open each of them, you're going to see the label in the image view in each of them. Now you'll notice that the spacing for this stack view, we have a gap, right? Because we specified that spacing, uh, but we haven't done so for these two. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I highlight this stack view here, go to spacing and hit 20 and then go to this stack view, go to spacing and hit 20. And then what we're going to do now, let's close all of these stack views. We're going to highlight all three of them. You can either hold shift on your keyboard and click this one so you highlight all of them, or you can hold command and just individually select all three, but you should have all three highlighted in blue like this. And then we're going to click on this stack view again. So when you do that, it's going to put all three of them into a horizontal stack view this time. So you should end up with something like this. You have a horizontal stack view and inside of that you have three vertical stack views. And then inside of each vertical stack view you have a label and an image view like that. So now let's click on the horizontal stack view. And for spacing I'm going to put 20. And that's going to add a 20 point gap in between each of those vertical stack views. Now the only thing we need to position is actually this outer stack view because it doesn't know, you know where to put this guy. right? So we have to uh, position that. So go ahead and highlight this horizontal stack view and then go down to the lower right, click on add new constraints and we're going to uncheck constraint to margins. We are just going to zero tab, zero tab, zero add four constraints like that and I don't mind if they're relative to the safe area that's fine actually instead of zeros we're gonna do 20 just to be consistent with the 20 uh, gaps in between each of the elements so it's gonna be 20 away from the top 20 from the left 20 from the right and 20 from the bottom let's add four constraints and then you're going to see this horizontal stack view being uh, pulled in all of these directions right here now you can see that inside they're still kind of not positioned correctly and we can actually change how they are distributed within a stack view. So let's go ahead, click that horizontal stack view. We go over to the right hand side to the inspector pane. I want to show you this alignment menu again. So if I click this, you're going to see top, center and bottom. Well, before when I showed you this, it said leading, center and trailing right for left aligned center aligned or right aligned right but how come this time it says top center and bottom well the reason is because last time we were looking at a vertical stack view and when you talk about alignment for a vertical stack view you are either aligning things to the left the center or the right when you're talking about a horizontal stack view which is what we have highlighted right now alignment refers to top center or bottom aligned so right now it's set to fill, which is basically going to stretch uh, the elements inside of it from the top all the way to the bottom. It's going to try to kind of fill up the entire space. That's fine. We're going to leave it like that. What I want to point out is distribution. So this is how the space is divided up horizontally. And if this were a vertical stack view, distribution would refer to how the space is divvied up vertically. All right, so looking at this horizontal stack view, we can either choose fill, which is the default, and it basically just gives each element the space that it needs. So that's why we kind of get this disproportionate spacing is because this is the size that we had that stack view originally. And these two elements, uh, this is the size that we had originally. So it's just gonna keep that size. However, if we choose something like fill equally, that is going to divide up the space between all of the elements inside equally. So let's go ahead and choose that. And you can see now that it actually gives each stack view this uh, an equal amount of space. It doesn't look like it because these image views are um, different sizes. But if you click 
the actual stack view like this, you're going to see that all of them actually have an equal amount of space uh, horizontally. Okay, so now the next thing we should do is probably give these image views some widths because uh, we basically want this image view to be as wide as the stack view that contains it. So we need to uh, do that. And in order to do that, we're basically going to highlight the image view and then hold down command and highlight the stack view which contains it so that both of them are highlighted. We're going to go down here to add new constraints and whoops, didn't mean to click that one. This one's add new constraints and we're going to say equal widths. When you do that, it adds a constraint you can see down here that says that the image view width should be the same width as the stack view. So let's do it for this other stack view and image view. Now highlight this image view, hold down command, select the stack view that contains it, go down here, equal widths, add constraint. So you're going to see that stretch out. Do the same thing for this last one. Highlight the image view, hold down command on your keyboard, and then click that stack view. Go down here, we're going to choose equal widths. Now there's actually a shortcut way to do this and now this is completely optional. I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to go first delete this constraint which I just added and the way you do this is if you uh, highlight the image view then you hold down control on your keyboard and then you click this image view and kind of drag it towards that stack view and then let go. It's going to pop up this little menu and you can simply select equal widths from there. So that has the same effect. Now that's sort of an advanced shortcut way to do it once you get more used to things. But remember, if your UI doesn't look like this, what I have right now, then chances are you've added incorrectly a constraint and it's very easy to fix. Just go ahead, you know, open up these little blue constraint menus, delete the constraints and then re-add them. Or you can click on a constraint and then you can edit the properties of that constraint on the right hand side. But at this point, you should have something that looks like this. Uh, so what we're going to do now is click on this root view here, and we are going to change that background to a black color, and then we are going to highlight the labels. So what you can do is you can expand each of these stack views so that you see all three labels. So click that and hold down command to click the second one. While still holding down command, click on the third one so you have all three of them highlighted, and then go over here. Um, in the attributes inspector, and you can change the text color to white for all three in one shot. And we're going to also change the font from regular to bold. And I'm going to change the text individually, actually. So for this label, this is going to be our burrito. This one is going to be our burger. And this one is going to be our salmon. All right, and now we can actually also set the images. So let's go ahead and click this UI image view. Click image, and we're going to choose burrito. Now, what has happened here? It suddenly just blew our label out of the view, although it's actually still there. If you take a look right here in the document outline, and this burrito kind of just uh, it's also distorted and we're going to highlight this burrito image view and then we're going to go to content mode instead of scale to fill we'll say aspect fill now that seems to have made things even worse you can see the image spilling out of the image view now and that's actually completely normal because the image is actually bigger than the image view and if we don't want the image to spill out what we can do is enable this clip to bounds property so if we click that it's going to clip the edges so that anything spilling out of the image view is kind of cropped or, you know, clipped. All right, so now we still have to address the reason for this image kind of pushing that label out of the view. This brings us to a very important question. In this case that we have right here, this stack view only goes from here, like about here, down to here. There's only a finite amount of space. So what happens when there's not enough space to display both elements like we have in this case right here? Because the image wants to take up all of the space and that really doesn't leave enough space for the label. So let me show you how we address that. Let's click on the label, 
this burrito label here you can see it's actually uh, a line it's like squished there's no height to it and let's go over here to the size inspector if you scroll all the way down you're gonna see a couple of things here you're gonna see content hugging priority and content compression resistance priority I'm gonna explain what content hugging priority is in a second but I want to point out what this one is when there's not enough space to display all of the elements this is what the auto layout system uses to determine which element should be squished. The element with the lower content compression resistance priority will be the one that gets squished. So in this case, I think by default they're both 750. So let's take a look at this. Right now I have the label highlighted and the vertical content compression resistance priority is 750. Now let's take a look at the image. If I click on the image and go down here, it's 750 as well. So that's why if you look at here in the document outline, if you look at this little red error icon and click it, it's telling us that there's some sort of uh, content ambiguity. And it's telling us that we need to set the vertical compression resistance priority for these elements. Because right now they're both tied at 750 and Xcode cannot determine which element to squish and which one not to. So let's go back to it and we need to give one of these a higher priority than the other. So for the label, let's give it a higher priority. So let's break the tie and give this guy 751. Because this guy has a higher priority against compression, um, it's not going to get squished. Xcode will rather resize this element that has a lower resistance priority than to squish the label because this one, this label, right, has 751 content compression resistance priority whereas uh, this burrito UI image view has 750. Now if I change this burrito image view to have a vertical uh, compression resistance priority to 752, then you're gonna see it actually takes out the label because now the label has a lower priority so it's gonna get squished, right? So we don't want that. Let's lower the vertical priority of the, um, of the UI image view. So the same problem is going to happen with these two, but I want to talk about content hugging priority. So content hugging priority is actually the opposite problem. What happens when we have too much space? You can see here in this stack view, the label is actually stretched out like this. So content hugging priority dictates when there is too much space, which element is going to get stretched to fill up that extra space. Because in a stack view, when the distribution is set to fill, it's going to try and fill up that entire stack view. So you can see right now, because the UI image view doesn't really have a size, um, it's just trying to stretch out the label to fill up the remaining amount of space. Now content hugging priority, like I said, determines when there is too much space, which element gets stretched out. The element with the higher content hugging priority will not get stretched. It's actually the element which has the lowest content hugging priority that is going to get squished. I know sometimes it's kind of hard to wrap your head around this because it feels like you're speaking in opposites. But the way I think about content hugging priority is I imagine hugging that element. So the tighter you hug it, as in the higher priority it has, the less likely it's going to get stretched out. So if I give this burger label a really high vertical content hugging priority, that means it's going to hug it really tight and it's not going to stretch it out. It's going to stretch out the other element like you see what happened here. The other one is actually easier to understand. Compression resistance It's exactly how it sounds, right? If you have a high compression resistance, then you're not going to get compressed. All right, so now let's set the image view for this guy. We're going to change back to this tab, Attributes Inspector. We're going to change the image to the burger. And we are going to change this to Aspect Fill. And we have the same sort of problem. So let's clip the bounds. And because this image is really large, there's not enough space to show both the label and the image. So we're going to have to set which element has a higher compression resistance. So obviously we want the label to be shown. Let's highlight the burger label and let's give it a high compression resistance on the vertical axis, higher than this image view at least. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing here. By now, you should understand what's happening. Let's choose salmon. Let's choose aspect fill. 
let's clip to bounds and then let's click on the salmon label let's go to size inspector and then we're going to up the vertical compression resistance priority so that it's higher than this image view all right so now let's uh, view as and take a look at this layout in a couple of different uh, screen sizes so let's go let's go up we've got the iPhone 10 here let's click the zoom buttons that looks good let's click on the iPhone 8 plus let's zoom out zoom back in looks good click on iPhone SE and the iPhone 4s and we can even change the orientation I mean, it's going to try its best to follow our auto layout constraint rules and the stack view configurations. And we're going to get something like this. Everything's still visible. It's going to zoom out, zoom back in. You know, obviously it's not ideal to have a portrait orientation for this sort of layout. However, you know, in our project properties, we configured it so that it should be landscape only. So that's going to prevent it from going into portrait anyways. All right, so let's test it out in our simulator. Let's choose iPhone 8. Let's click Run. And it's not going to change it to landscape uh, by default, so we're going to press Command and right arrow, and you can see it like this. So today you learned about stack views and how they can be used to position elements. You also learned about content hugging priority and content compression resistance priority. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel by clicking the subscribe button below. And if you don't want to miss a single video, make sure you click that bell icon as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, welcome to lesson 4 of 10. Equipped with your new skills in auto layout and stack views, it's time to put your skills to the test. By the end of this video, you're going to have built the user interface for our war card game app. We're going to start a brand new Xco project. Make sure you're looking under the iOS tab at single view app let's click next for the product name i'm going to call it the war app and the rest of the details should be the same as your previous project so you don't need to change any of it the only thing i want you to make sure of is that the language says swift and if it doesn't just hit this drop down and select it let's click next and then let's save it on the desktop or anywhere you'd like the first thing we're going to do is add the graphic assets into our xcode project so below the video, you're going to find a link to download these assets. It's called Lesson 4 Assets. Just go ahead and click that link, download that zip file, save it on your desktop. And I've already done that, so I'm going to go ahead and double click that zip file to unzip it. After you unzip it, you're going to get a folder. If you open up that folder, you're going to see all of the graphic assets for our project. Now you might notice that each of these uh, assets come in a set of three. So let's open up a set of these assets. I'm going to open up back.png. This is the back of the card. Let's open up back at 2x.png and back at 3x.png. If I spread them out a little bit, you can see that back.png is the original size. Back at 2x.png is two times that size. And the 3x version is just 3x the size of the original. And the reason why we have three different sizes for the same graphic asset is to accommodate the different iPhone screen resolutions. So the Retina screens use the at 2x version and the larger screens like the iPhone 8 Plus use the at 3x version. Let's go ahead and close these now. We're going to actually just add all of these to our project. So first, go into the asset library for your Xcode project and then go back to the folder. Hit Command A on your keyboard to select everything and then let's drag and drop them into our asset library. And you're going to see that Xcode is smart enough to group all of the different sizes together. So if you click on, let's say back, you're going to see the 1x, 2x and 3x grouped together like that. So you should have back, background, card 2 all the way to card 14, deal button and logo. Now let's go back to the main.storyboard and in the lower right hand corner in the library pane make sure you're looking at this object library tab in the filter box let's type in image view and let's drag and drop that guy right there and make sure you've selected it in the document outline let's go to add new constraints we're going to uncheck constraint margins and i'm going to pull down these little drop 
dropdowns and I'm going to choose view inside of safe area because I want this background to be edge to edge. Let's go ahead and do that. And then let's change all of these to zero. So zero tab, zero tab, zero tab. And hitting the tab button on your keyboard just helps you jump from box to box. And I just want to draw to your attention if you um, change it to view now or you click view again like I'm doing now that number changes so just be cautious of that and make sure that those are zeros and in any case even if you add the wrong constraint you know how to edit it or remove it and re-add it because we learned that in lesson two so let's go ahead and add these four constraints you're going to see your UI view stretched from edge to edge even all the way to the top and if yours doesn't look like that just go in the document outline delete all four constraints and try that again okay so now having the image view highlighted in the inspector pane on the right hand side um, choose image and let's choose background like that the second thing we're going to do is we're going to add a stack view a vertical one because we're going to have the logo we have the cards everything's kind of stacked in a vertical fashion so let's go down here in that filter box let's search for stack view i'm going to add a, a vertical stack view just like that and now we're going to set some constraints for it click add new constraints i'm going to remove constraint margins and i'm going to put zeros for all of them again but this time i'm going to leave them relative to the safe area because i don't want the elements in the stack view to be blocked by anything so let's add those four constraints. You'll see that um, they are edge to edge except for the top here where the status bar is covered. Okay, so we're good for that. And now it's time to add some elements. So let's go back to the stack view here. And again, we're gonna search for image view. So go ahead and drag that into the stack view. Um, in the document outline, you should see the stack view right here. And then you should see the image view is inside of the stack view. If you collapse the stack view, that image view should be inside of it. Okay, and the background is outside, it's behind the stack view. Okay, so we've got this image view here. Um, we are going to add another stack view. And this time it's going to be a horizontal stack view. So rather than dragging it onto the screen here, I'm actually going to drag it into the document outline. And the way I've done it here is I've put it inside this stack view, but below the image view. So if you collapse the stack view, both the horizontal stack view and the image view should be inside of it. And in fact, I'm actually going to click this. You can hit enter and I'm going to just rename this right now and call it the root stack view. So when I refer to the root stack view, you know, I'm talking about this guy, the stack view that contains everything. Okay. So we've got this stack view, this horizontal one right here. And in the filter box, we're going to type in image view again. And we are going to drag this into the document outline. And this time I'm going to put it inside that horizontal stack view. Okay. So if I collapse this, you should see that image view being tucked inside of it. I'm going to do that again because we have two cards. And again, I'm going to put it inside. Now, if you accidentally put it on the outside, let's say, you know, you put it somewhere like that. And then you collapse that stack view and that image view is still there. Just go ahead and put it inside like that. You can rearrange them. And sometimes it takes a little bit of patience to get it just right. Okay, so we've got two image views here. These two represent the two cards. So it's starting to get a little bit confusing in the UI here. So let's start setting some images and start naming some of these things. So I'm going to call this the card stack view. And you can hit enter to rename it. And this one, I'm going to change the distribution to fill equally. And right, so you can see that change down there. And for this image view, I'm going to click it and in the inspector property I'm going to choose back and in this one I'm going to choose back as well so don't worry that it doesn't look quite right right now all right so there's our card stack view containing the two card images for this one above it this one is supposed to be the logo so I'm going to scroll down and choose the logo like that and then right now it really doesn't look right but we can deal with that in a second okay and now we're going to go to button and we are going to drag this button. Now, this part is going to be a little tricky because we want to put it into the root stack view, but below the card stack view. And sometimes when you drag this button here, it wants to put itself inside this card stack view. Look, 
I've just accidentally put it inside the card stack view and you can see there's a card, there's a card, and then there's a button beside it. That's incorrect. I actually want the button outside of it. So an easy way to position it is if you drag this guy out and then just drag it in between the logo and the button like that, you know, it's not supposed to be there, but now you can collapse this card stack view and then just move this one above the button. And so that's an easy way to get, get what you want. For the root stack view, what we can do now is actually highlight it on the right hand side, change the distribution to fill equally. So that's going to give an equal amount of space to all of the elements inside of it. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add some labels. So let's go down here in the bottom right. Let's choose label or type in label rather. And let's drag this label. And again, I'm going to just drag it into the document outline and put it below that button. You know, everything should actually be inside of this root stack view. So I just want you to do a sanity check here. So collapse that root stack view. You shouldn't see any elements outside of that stack view. If they are, just click it and drag it into the root stack view. And inside the root stack view, you should have the logo, the card stack view, which contains these two card images, and then a button, and then the label. So let's add a couple more labels. Let's click and drag that guy. I'll put it in between the button and the label. Let's click it and do that again. We're going to add a total of four. Let's do that again. Okay, and then I'm going to select all four labels. You can hold down command and you can individually select all four. And then let's change the color of the text to white. And then now what we're going to do is to, let's select it from here. We're going to select that label and hold down command and select the second label. And we are going to click this button to put them both into a stack view. All right, so that's going to put them into a vertical stack view. We're going to do the same for these two bottom ones. Click this guy, hold down command to select this guy simultaneously. And then we're going to click this button and embed that into a vertical stack view as well. So now in the document outline below this button element, you should have two vertical stack views inside of each of them. You're going to have two labels. Okay. Now let's collapse these two stack views, hold down command, select both of them simultaneously like that. And then let's click this embed in stack view again. So now you're going to have a vertical stack view with two vertical stack views inside each of them containing two labels. However, for this stack view, that contains all of the stuff below it, we're going to change this to a horizontal axis. So go on the right hand side in the inspector pane and let's change that to horizontal. And then you're going to get something that looks like this. It still doesn't look quite right, but we're going to fix it. So in this horizontal stack view that you just changed, let's change the distribution to fill equally. And then for this first stack view in here, let's change alignment to center and let's change distribution to fill equally. And then for this one that contains the labels on the right hand side, we're going to do the same alignment is center and distribution is fill equally. So now it's starting to take shape. Okay. So for this label that is on top on the left hand side, let's change that to change the player, uh, the text, to player, and then let's change the font to a bold type of font. And then for this one, right here, we're going to change that to CPU and then we're going to change the font weight to, to bold. And then for this label right here, we're going to change that to a zero for this label. We're going to change that to a zero. Okay. So now we have pretty much all the elements on the screen. It still doesn't look quite right, but we're not done yet. So for this button, Let's go here uh, and change the image to deal button and let's erase that text right there. Okay. Starting to take shape for this logo up here. I want you to click that and right now it's set to scale to fill. So it's stretching it out and I want to change that just to center instead. And so we're, it's not going to try and stretch it. It's just going to center that image inside of the image view. And for these guys right here, instead of scale to fill, you know, it's really pulling it in all directions to fill up the image view. I'm going to change it to aspect fit and same thing for this guy. I'm going to change from scale to fill to aspect fit. 
and then you get something like this which looks like what you intended so um, one thing is that one thing we can change is for this root stack view if you feel like it's stretching all the way down here too much we can just bump everything up a little bit so for this root stack view select it let's go into size inspector and scroll down to all of the constraints that relate to the root stack view and for this one that it aligns the bottom of the stack view to the safe area let's click edit and let's change that constant to something like 20 and then you're gonna see it bump up just by a bit all right so let's take a look at this UI in a couple of different orientations and devices so down here it says view as iPhone 8 I'm just gonna open that up and I'll leave it at portrait right now so we'll test out the portrait ones first let's choose the iPhone 10 and let's minimize it a little bit so we can see everything and if your screen turns white and you can't see anything just change the zoom level here if you can't see these zoom controls just hide this document outline by clicking this button here um, that's going to create more space here to allow you to see those zoom buttons all right let's see the iphone 8 plus like you see my screen just turned white let's just zoom in and zoom back out this is the iPhone SE this is the iPhone 4s okay so that, now let's check out the uh, horizontal ones or landscape orientation so change the orientation uh, looks pretty good you know the cards are kind of small which is something that we can definitely address clicking that now it looks a little messed up but that's just kind of a refresh issue so let's zoom out and zoom back in and you can see that it looks fine now on these bigger screens you can see that the cards are really small and the reason for this is because the root stack view we told it to distribute its space equally between all of the elements so the logo gets an equal chunk of space the cards get an equal chunk of space the buttons the labels down here they all get an equal chunk of space if we wanted these cards to be bigger we would actually have to tell this root stack view instead of distribution fill equally we might say something like fill and then you can see it looks a lot better right but the problem is if we change the distribution to fill if we go back to the portrait orientation you can see that the things start to look scrunched up so this real solution here is if we have distribution to be fill equally for this vertical orientation but for the horizontal orientation you know that we could change the distribution to fill and that is something that we can do actually I'll show you that in a second but first we need to talk about something called size classes size classes are basically categories of screen sizes because there are so many devices and two orientations for each device that Apple decided to separate all of these into different categories of screen sizes so when you're adding a constraint you are able to say something like add this constraint for all size classes as in all categories of screen sizes or only add this constraint for a specific size class so this gives us some flexibility to change the layout depending on a specific size class let's say your app might look different on the iPad size classes versus like a smaller device like an iPhone and each size class is defined by two parameters a height and a width now the height can be compact or regular and the width can also be compact or regular so for instance one size class might be compact width and compact height another size class might be compact width but regular height and in the case where you don't care about size classes and you want to add your constraint for all size classes it would be any width and any height now let's dive back into our Xcode project and I can show you how we can add a constraint for a specific size class now the first thing I want you to look at is down here in the view as iPhone 10 you can see the size class here that this is it is compact width and compact height let's change it to the portrait orientation and you can see that size class changes to compact width but regular height so just to reiterate what we want we want distribution to be fill equally on the compact width and regular height or actually we want it to be filled equally for any size class but when it comes to this size class right the 
compact width and compact height, we want distribution to be fill instead. Right? So that's just for that case, just for that size class of compact width and compact height, we want distribution to be fill. Otherwise, we want fill equally for all other size classes. So this is where you're going to, um, let's set it back to fill equally. And we are looking at this size class right now, right? Compact width and compact height. And we're gonna click this vary for traits button. And we're gonna introduce a variation based on uh, the width and the height. So we're gonna click both and then just click out of that. And this section turns blue. Right? And it shows you, you're, you are currently varying for all of these uh, screens. All of these screens are in this size class or in this category of uh, screen size. I don't know if you've noticed, but we are actually missing a screen size. Um, there was one to the left of this iPhone 10, and that was the iPhone 8 Plus. Now let's take a look at why varying for this size class doesn't include that iPhone 8 Plus. So I'm going to click done varying to kind of get back to all size classes. And let's go ahead and click this iPhone 8 Plus. Well, this iPhone 8 Plus is not in the same size class as these other guys. It's in the regular width and compact height. And the reason is, is because this screen is just so big that it, it counts as regular width. It doesn't count as a compact width. Whereas these other guys, like the iPhone 10, counts as a compact width. So if we wanted, you know, to also add the, our constraint um, for this size class as well, what we're going to do is we're going to click on vary for traits, but we're going to introduce the variation simply on the height. We're going to say that um, for any compact height size class, we don't care about what width it is, whether it's regular width or compact width, we don't care. We only want to care about the height. So if it's compact height, right, now you can see that it includes the iPhone 8, right? Whereas before when I varied on both of them, both the height and the width, um, it did not. So I'm just gonna vary on the height right now, right? So I'm gonna have this blue section here and it tells us we are varying for the compact height devices. And what I'm gonna do is go up to distribution. It should be set to fill equally right now. Click this little plus icon beside distribution. And here I can say, again, you can kind of set the variation that you want. Leave it as width is any and the height is compact. Click add variation. And then now you can see that you can actually change this value specifically for this size class, which is compact height. So. I'm going to change this to fill and now it's basically going to use fill equally for all cases except for size classes of compact height. In that case, it's going to use fill. All right, let's click done varying down here and then let's test this out. So if I go into portrait mode, you can see that it uses fill equally. It still looks good. But when I go into landscape mode, you can see that it uses fill and my cards look bigger than they were before. Let's go check out the iPhone 10. See how big those cards are? When I go into a portrait, you can still see that everything is spaced out evenly. All right, so let's run this in the simulator as a last task. And I'm gonna choose the iPhone 8 Plus simulator this time. All right, so here we are with the portrait orientation. I'm gonna press Command and the right arrow, and here we have the landscape orientation. And then let us stop this project, and let's choose a small one like the, the 5S, and let's launch that. Oh, and we've actually popped up a different simulator. So here we have the portrait orientation. Let's press Command, right arrow, and here we've got the landscape one, and both look pretty good. That's awesome, right? If you're having trouble putting this layout together, just leave me a comment below and I'll jump right in to help out. Also, make sure you download my Xcode project so that you can compare it with your own. You can get it by following the link in the description below. Now I want to turn it over to you. Now that we've built the War Card Game user interface, was it easier than you expected or was it harder than you expected? 
Let me know by leaving a quick comment below. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel by hitting the subscribe button below. And if you don't want to miss a single video, make sure you click that bell icon as well. Remember, you can download my Xcode project that I showed you in this video by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Hi, welcome to lesson 5, you're halfway there. In this lesson, we're diving right into the Swift programming language. For this video and the next two, you're going to be learning about the basics of Swift. This is stuff that you're going to need to know in order to complete the project that we're working on together. I know that the coding part is intimidating to a lot of people, but I want you to stick with this lesson and the next two. Really pay attention and I recommend that you open up Xcode on your own computer and type out exactly what I'm showing you on the screen. By doing that, it's going to help you remember the language structure and the keywords without having to memorize anything. And I promise you, by lesson 10, you will be able to write Swift code. All right, let's get started. When you launch Xcode, you're gonna see this option here to get started with the playground. So go ahead and click that. And we're under iOS, we're just gonna choose a blank playground. Go ahead and create that on your desktop. You're gonna see something like this. A playground is not an entirely new Xcode project like we've been creating in the past few lessons. Rather, it's a lightweight place where we can test out some code. So it's perfect for what we need to do. If you don't have the line numbers on the left hand side there and you'd like them, just go into your Xcode preferences under the text editing section of the preferences. You'll see a checkbox that you can enable to show your line numbers. In this playground right here, you're going to see this editor area in the middle where you can write some code. On the top, you're going to see a status bar. Mine says ready right now. Yours might say launching simulator or it might be spinning and doing something. And when it turns ready, you're going to see some text on the right hand side here. Now this is sort of like a preview pane. I don't want you to pay too much attention to what goes on right here because uh, depending on your version of Xcode, you might see something different than what I see and I don't want you to get confused. Uh, what we are going to do, however, is click this little arrow right here to show this console area. And we're going to focus on the output that is down here rather than the output here. Okay, so let's talk about some of the code that you see on the screen, starting from the top. At the top, you're going to see this text in green. This isn't actually code that is going to be executed. These are called comments. And they're basically notes or remarks that you can leave for yourself to remind yourself what this piece of code does or why you wrote it. You can write a comment as long as you start the line with these two forward slashes. Anything you write after that on the same line will be regarded as a comment and it won't be run as code. For example, down here, we can start with two forward slashes and we can say a comment like just testing out some code. Now, obviously when you write comments for your own projects, they are going to be much more meaningful than that but this is just to demonstrate a comment. When you're working with a team of people, it's crucial that you leave comments to show your teammates your reasoning and your rationale behind the code that you're writing. If you're working by yourself, it's also crucial to leave comments because when you come back to your project months later down the road, you won't remember why you wrote that code unless you've left yourself comments. Now the line below the comment, import UI kit, UIKit is something that we're going to talk a lot about later, but for now, just know that it's a library full of code that Apple provides, and it contains a lot of useful stuff for building apps. Import is a special keyword that says that we want to use that library of code. By importing it, we'll be able to take advantage of the UIKit library. Before we talk about the next line of code, this one right here, we need to talk about variables. In an app, there's lots of data being passed around. You need a way to keep track of this data. That's what variables are for. You can think of variables as kind of like a sticky tab. You know those ones where you can stick on a page, you can give it a name, and it keeps track of that page, or in our case, a piece of data. Let's talk about the line of code below. Now following our analogy, var is a special keyword in Swift that creates a new sticky tab. str is, in this case, the name that we write on the sticky tab. Hello world is the piece of data that we want this variable to keep track of. The equal sign is assigning that data to that variable. In the case of our analogy, it's like sticking that sticky tab on the page that we want to keep track of. Now this line of code here on line seven makes sense, right? We are declaring a new variable called str and we are assigning hello playground to it. Now using our sticky tab analogy, what if we changed our mind, peeled off that sticky tab and stuck it on another page? Well, we can do that with our variable too, but there's just one catch. Let's just say that we used a permanent marker to write the name on that sticky tab so we can't change the name. 
This is how our variable works. Just like moving our sticky tab to point to another page, we can point our variable to another piece of data as well. Notice that we don't use the var keyword on this line because we only needed it in line seven to create that variable. Now I just said create so it's easier to understand but the proper terminology is declaring a variable. So we declared str on line seven and on line nine, we're simply assigning it another piece of data. So you can see that now that we have another line of code, we have an another preview here but again, I don't want you to pay attention to that because your preview might look different than what I have depending on your version of Xcode. I alluded to being able to uh, show the output down here and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to use a keyword called print and that's going to allow us to output the contents of our variable. So in here, in between these two statements, let's write print and then you want to open a round bracket like that. And this menu that comes up is Xcode trying to auto-complete what you're writing. In other words, it's just Xcode trying to make your life easier by trying to guess what you want to type and allowing you to select it from this menu. We don't need to do that right now. Type str, and if you don't have this closing bracket that I have here, just on your keyboard, hit the closing bracket to complete the statement. When you do that down here, in the console area, you should see hello playground. And this is the contents of the str variable, which is what the print statement does. Now on your own playground, if you don't see that output yet, you might see at the top of the status bar, it doesn't say ready. Instead, it might be like running the code or something like that. Or if you don't even see that, what I want you to make sure is that this icon here, this play button is in blue. And if yours is not, then I want you to click and hold this and make sure that it's set to automatically run. Because if you set it to manually run, you're gonna to have to uh, click this play button every time you want it to process the code. But when it's set to automatically run, every time we change the code in this editor area, it's going to rerun the code and uh, process all of the output that it needs to show down here. Now let's try printing the contents of str again, but this time after we've changed it. So type print, open up a round bracket, str, and then you can close that round bracket. And then it's processing, but after it processes, you can see down here that this is the first print statement, this is the second print statement. So you see, after we changed what our variable is pointing to, and we printed it out, indeed, it says another playground. Next, we're gonna talk about constants. Constants are just like variables, except that once you assign data to it, that's it. That constant can't point to anything else. Following our sticky tab analogy, imagine that before you stuck the tab on the sheet of paper, you applied some super glue and then you stuck it on the paper. There's no way you're gonna peel off that tab. That's like a constant. The syntax for a constant is pretty much the same, except that we use the let keyword instead of the var keyword, which we used before. Let's go back to our playground and try it out. So we're going to type this out using let. We're gonna say let str equals um, yet another playground. Now your Xcode might be processing, but once it does, you're going to see that it declares an error here and it's gonna highlight this line in red. And also in the console, you'll see that there is an error. The problem is that constants and variables must have different names because otherwise it would be quite confusing. Let's change the name of our constant. Now I'm just going to call it con and now the error goes away and everything is fine. Let's try assigning something different to our con constant. And let Xcode do its thing, and then it's going to tell you that you cannot assign another piece of data to our constant. Because like I said, a constant, once you assign a piece of data to it, that's it. Now you might be wondering, why would we want to use a constant versus a variable? Well, sometimes when you're programming and you wanna keep track of a piece of data and you wanna make sure that no one else touches it or changes it, that's when you would use a constant. You would use a variable when you expect that the data it points to will change or maybe it gets updated or something like that. So let's go ahead and erase this line here. Now I don't know if you've noticed, but so far we've only been assigning pieces of text to our constants and variables. Well, there are other types of data that we can assign too. This brings us to the next topic data types.
The pieces of text that we've been assigning to our variables and constants are called strings. Now I know it's kind of a strange term. I remember when I first started programming, I thought of those as strings of characters forming a piece of text. The next data type is Boolean or bool for short. A Boolean value is going to be either true or false. Perfect for keeping track of those pieces of data, which are only going to be one of two values. Don't worry, we're going to try all of these out in the playground in just a second. Next up, we have integers or int for short. These represent integers, just like you learned in math class. Integers are whole numbers in the positive or negative range, including zero. You might ask, what about decimals? Don't worry, we've got that. Float is what you're looking for. The float data type represents floating point data. In other words, your decimal numbers. We've just covered four data types and we're about to go back to our playground and try them out. But I just want to say there are more data types. However, these four are great to start with. At the end, I have a swift cheat sheet that includes the rest of them. And I have a worksheet for you to get extra practice from too. All right, let's go back to the playground and try this stuff out. All right, first let's try out Booleans. So I'm going to declare, I'm just going to use the variable name B and we're just going to type the value as true. Now this is a Boolean. Now let's print out B like that. And you're going to see down here that it says true. The other value that you can assign B to is simply false. And true or false are special keywords in Swift that you can use as the values for a Boolean variable. Next up, we have integers. So let's create one like this. And you know, an integer can be something like that, you know, or it can be zero. Or like we said, it could be a negative number. All right, now let's try working with some float data types. So I'm going to use the variable f and we're going to say something like that or something like that for instance. And then we can also go ahead and print this out and we'll print out f and we'll print out i as well. And you can see that with the print statement down here, the contents of the variable is just the last value that I've assigned to it. Now that we've gone through data types, let me tell you one other thing about variables and constants. A variable or a constant can only store data of one type. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me demonstrate. So for example, we have this variable i here and we've assigned to it an integer and we can reassign it different integers, right? But however, let me try to assign it suddenly a float. And it's going to say, I can't assign a double to a type int. And double is just another data type that stores decimal numbers, just like float does, except that it's less precise. It can't store as many decimal places as a float data type can. Anyways, it's saying that we can't assign a value of type double, which is what this is, to a type of int, which is what i is. But where did we specify that our variable i could only store int data types. We didn't specify that, in fact. What it did was it took the first thing that you assigned to that variable and it basically inferred the data type from that value. Because we assigned 32 into the variable i and 32 is an int, this variable assumed that it would only store int values. And so suddenly when we try to assign it a double or a float value, that's going to cause an error. Same thing goes for these other lines of code up here. So var b equals false. b now can only store Boolean values, right? If I did b equals true, that would be fine. But if I suddenly did, you know, b equals test or something like that, and I tried to assign a string to it, you'll see that there is another error. So I just want you to make a mental note of that. So let me just erase these lines of code like that. Another thing I want you to make aware of is that we can explicitly state that a variable can only store a certain data type. And we do that when we declare the variable here and we use colon and then we type out the data type that tells Xcode that we want this variable I to only store integer types. If I declare my variable like this, and I say that I can only store integer types and I suddenly try to um, assign it a float, it's not going to like that, even though it's the first thing I'm assigning to it, All right? So 
that is just something I wanted you to know. I can do this with this as well, just to show you what the data type names are, like that. So that's all fine. I'm just explicitly stating that these variables store this data type, float, int, bool, and string. At the same time, like you saw, we can leave that out and it will just infer from the first piece of data that we assign it that that is the data type for that variable. So that is your first lesson in Swift programming. You learned about variables, constants, and how they can store values. You also learned about data types, specifically bool, string, int, and float. I have a Swift cheat sheet for you guys that covers all of this stuff and it's going to be a handy reference to keep around as you're learning Swift. I also have a worksheet for you that's going to cover using variables and performing math operations on them. So I highly recommend that you download that and check it out. You can get them both by following the URL that's on the screen or the URL in the description below. But first, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel by clicking the subscribe button below. And if you don't want to miss a single video, make sure you click that bell icon as well. Now I want to turn it over to you. Is Swift programming your first time learning coding or do you know some other programming language? Let me know by leaving a quick comment below. So thanks for watching you guys and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, welcome to lesson six. In the last lesson, you learned some basic Swift code. Let me ask you something. How does the user interact with an app? Usually it's something like the user takes an action, such as tapping a news headline, and the app reacts by displaying that article. Action, reaction. Well, that implies that when the user takes an action, we need to be able to run some specific pieces of code. In that case, we need a way to organize our code into bite-sized chunks so that when the user takes this action, we run this block of code, and when the user takes that action, we run another block of code. Well, Swift has something called functions, and this is basically wrapping up a block of code and giving it a name so that when we need to execute that code, we just call it by its name. So let's dive into a playground and see how we use functions. We're going to start by creating a brand new playground. So go ahead, get started with the playground. Under iOS, let's choose blank playground, and I'm going to call this the functions playground and just save it on the desktop. So in order to declare a function, we use the keyword FUNC, and then we type a space, and then we type in the name of the function. Now the name that we give the function is the same name that we're going to call the function with to execute the code inside the function. So I'm gonna call this one, say hello. The next thing we do is open up a pair of rounded brackets like that. Now inside those brackets, there can be things called parameters, which we're going to cover later on in this lesson. But for now, we're going to just leave it as an empty set of rounded brackets. Next, we're going to hit space and find the curly brackets on your keyboard. And we're going to open up a pair of those just like that. An opening one and a closing one. And inside of those curly brackets, that's where the code for our function goes. So let's hit enter a couple of times to create some space. And inside this function, I'm going to have only a single line of code. I'm just going to print something into the console. So I'm going to print out hello, just like that. Now notice that in the console, nothing gets output because the code inside my function is not going to be run until I actually call that function by its name. Now let's go down here in line 12 and I'll demonstrate how to call it. All you have to do is type the name of the function followed by those rounded brackets like that. And then you're going to see the output because it's running this line of code. When you write a function, you usually think about performing a specific task. In our earlier use case, you might write a function to display an article so that when the user taps on the news headline, you can run that function to display that article. Now, sometimes a function may require some sort of input to perform its task. For example, what happens when the user taps on headline number one versus news headline number two. Are you gonna write a different function for every single news headline? Of course you're not. And furthermore, the news changes every day, so you can't write a function for a piece of news that hasn't come out yet. Instead, you write a function that displays an article, but it doesn't know or care which one it is. You have to specify which article it should show when you call that function by passing that article into the function. And then your function will take that input and display that article. 
You can do this with function parameters. Remember those rounded brackets in the function call? Well, inside of those brackets, you can specify what sort of data you want to be passed into the function when it's called. In the example below, we declare a function called say hello to. In between the brackets, you have a parameter called name that is of the data type string. That kind of looks like a variable declaration, but without the var keyword, right? Whenever you call the say hello to function, you're going to have to supply a piece of text with that function call. Now let's go into the playground and see how we can work with function parameters. Now, as you were typing that function name, you might have noticed Xcode try to autocomplete it for you. So let me demonstrate just in case that didn't happen for you. Let me erase this function call. And let me start typing the names more uh, slowly. S A Y. As you can see, it pops up this autocomplete menu trying to uh, help you out. So if you see what you want to type out already, you can simply hit enter because it's already highlighted the function call I wanted to type out. Or if it's not this particular one, but you see it somewhere down here, you can hit the up or down arrow keys on your keyboard to select it and then hit enter. So we're going to select this one because that's what we're intending to call and it will complete that function call for you. All right. So now before I demonstrate the function with the parameters, why don't we go ahead and add a comment here and just call this one the basic function because we're going to have a couple of different things in here. So this one's a function with a with parameters, I'm going to say. All right, so let's write out our function say hello to, and then we're going to open up our pair of uh, round brackets. But this time inside there, we are going to put a parameter. Now, this parameter is going to dictate that when you call this function say hello to, you're going to have to pass in some data. And this parameter basically dictates what sort of data you're supposed to pass in. So I'm going to call my parameter name and then colon followed by the type of data that I want to be passed in. And there you go. That's one parameter that needs to be passed in. Space, open up a pair of uh, curly brackets. In between there, we're going to hit enter a couple of times where we are going to write our code. Now in here, I want to print out the name that gets passed in. Well, how do I access that data that gets passed in? Well, this parameter here actually has a parameter name and Conveniently, we called it name. So this is how we access that data that gets passed in by referencing this parameter name. So all I need to do is say print name like that. And down here, of course, nothing gets output until we call the function. Now watch this. I'm going to start typing S A Y and now Xcode will show me there are a couple of different function calls I can make. This one was our basic function. And this one is our new one that includes a parameter. So I'm going to go ahead and press the down key and then press enter. And it's going to basically auto complete that function. Um, and it's going to highlight the parameter that we need to uh, specify in order to complete the function call. So I'm going to pass in a string piece of data in there, open up a pair of quotation marks and let's put in Tom. Right? And this actually completes the function call. And you can see here, down here, it says prints out Tom. And this piece of text gets passed in to the function call through this parameter. And then this line of code basically just takes that parameter and prints it out into the console. Notice that in here, um, I have to specify that parameter name followed by colon and then followed by the actual piece of data that I want passed in. Now, what if I want to print out hello Tom instead of just the name. Well, I'm going to show you something cool where you can actually insert a variable or a parameter. Your parameter is basically a variable. You know, insert that variable into a string or a piece of text. So let's write a piece of text here. Let's say hello and space. And then in order to insert name dynamically into this piece of text, you do backslash, open up a pair of rounded brackets like that. And in between those rounded brackets, you put the name of your variable. In our case, it would be just name. And so now you can see down here, it says, hello, space, Tom. Don't worry about this. If you, you know, don't remember how to do that, we're going to actually use this again in a couple of lessons. Now I want to show you how you can specify a function that has more than one parameter. So right up here, we have name colon string. If we wanted to specify a second parameter, all we need to do is just hit, hit comma and space and we're going to add another parameter. 
this time I'm going to call it h colon int. It's going to be int data type. And so now Xcode detects because we've changed it so that calling this function requires two data inputs now. Xcode notices that, hey, we're not doing that here, and that's an error. So I'm just going to erase this line of code. Say. Now I can actually just select it from this autocomplete menu and hit enter. And you can see this structure kind of coincides with what's up here, right? I have name, colon, and then I have to specify the string data to pass in, followed by a comma, and then age, which is the second parameter name, colon, followed by the actual int data that I want passed in. So let's pass in uh, Tom, and I press tab. It allows me to just jump straight to specifying the second parameter there. And let me just put 35. And of course, it still says hello, Tom, because we haven't incorporated this second parameter. So in this statement here, hello name, let's put comma, you are, I want to insert the age at this point, age space years old. Now what's output down here, just give a moment for Xcode to process the new code. Hello, Tom, you're 35 years old. And that's just based on what we type in here. You know, I can say 45, and that's going to turn into 45 years old. So you can expand on this and you can do three parameters or four parameters, um, but I wouldn't go crazy with this. In the future, you're going to learn about how uh, you can actually collect pieces of data together and specify them in a single parameter. But for now, you know, you're passing simple values around. And so if you need to pass in three or four or five, you know, or eight parameters, then go ahead and do that. One thing I do want to point out though, is that in your function call, you can actually uh, make it so that you can omit these parameter names here. So I could call my function like this, right? Right now, this is going to be an error, right? But let me show you how to make it so that you can omit these parameter names. And that kind of saves you some typing. Uh, so here, up here, you can specify underscore and then space right in front of that parameter name. Same with the second parameter, underscore and then space. When you do that, let's just erase this function call because this is now incorrect. I'm going to use autocomplete again. Say hello to, now you can see this entire thing is highlighted. If I specify my parameter, you can see now I don't need to put those labels in there. What you're actually doing with this underscore is you're omitting the argument label for that parameter. But I'm not going to go into that now because I don't want to confuse you. If you do want to learn about that, I'll link to something in the description below and you can look into it if you're curious. But down the line, once you learn more about Swift, you're going to learn about it anyways. For now, all you need to know is that underscore space in front of your parameter name allows you to omit it from the function call like this. Now you know how to write functions which expect some sort of input to work with. Another great use of functions is to take some data input, transform it, and then return that result. Functions can do this by using the return keyword. In the function below, it takes an integer input and then it adds four to it and then it gives it back to us. Notice in this function declaration that after the rounded brackets, we have an arrow and then we have a data type, int. This indicates the type of data that the function will give back when you call it. Let's go back to our playground and try it out. All right, so now let's create another section down here and let's create some space here so we can look at the middle of the screen. And I'm going to call this function with return value. Okay, so let's type out our function that we demonstrated. Add four to, that's a capital T, and open up a bracket. We're going to type in x colon int. That's going to be the data that needs to be passed in, an integer. And this time, we are going to type dash. Make sure you've got a space here, dash, greater than symbol, and then space. And now we specify the type of the data that this function will return. So I'm actually going to return an int data type. Let's open up a pair of curly brackets and let's create some space down here. So what I'm going to do here, I am going to create a variable. Let's say, I'm going to call this the sum equals, and we're going to take the 
parameter that gets passed in, which is x, and I'm going to add 4 to it. So the variable sum contains x plus 4. Now, since we specified that this function actually returns a value, we need to somehow get this sum to be returned. And we use a keyword called return. That's exactly how it sounds. And we are going to return this sum just like that. And in fact, if you forget the return keyword, but you have specified up here that this function returns something, Xcode isn't going to like that. It's going to spit out an error actually. And it's telling you that it's missing a return statement. So you're going to have to return the sum. Now what happens with a function that returns a value? How do you call it and how do you get that value that it returned? Well, let's first start by calling the function. So add four and autocomplete pops up. Just going to hit enter. Actually, I want to point out something special here. You can see here in this autocomplete menu on this left column, you can see int. This tells you that it returns an int data type. Okay, let's hit enter. And now we have to specify the data input. So let's put 10 in there. So the actual function code will add four to it. And then it's going to return 14. Oh, where, where did that 14 go? Well, we actually have to keep track of it by assigning it to a variable. So let's create a new variable. Let's call it result equals add four two, and then we pass in 10. So this function is going to take our 10, add four to it. It's going to spit out 14 and we are going to assign that data to our result variable. And now down here, let's try printing out the contents of result. And we're going to see that it is 14. Now you might ask me, why do I have to use this return value? Why do I have to create a function that uses this return keyword and I have to specify the data type that it returns? Can't I just simply refer to this variable sum because doesn't it contain my x plus four? Well, that brings me to my next topic, variable scope. I want you to try down here to print out the variable sum. You're going to get an error once Xcode gets around to processing the code. And it's saying that use of unresolved identifier sum, which basically means that it can't find this keyword. It can't find what sum is. And the reason for that is because all of the code in between these two curly brackets, you know, the code that's inside this function is inside of its own scope. It's kind of like its own little bubble. So any data that you have in here, the variables that you declare and stuff like that, you can't access it from outside of this scope. So that's why even though I've declared sum in here, this variable, I can't access it from outside of the function. I can access it from inside this function, you know, because it's in the same scope. So I can actually print out some right there and that would be fine well, as soon as Xcode finishes processing it. So now we actually see two 14s because the first one is from this statement, printing it out. And then the second 14 is from printing out the result of calling out that function. But anyways, my point is that from inside the function, you can reference that variable that you declare in there because when you declare that variable in here, it only exists in this scope within this function. You can't access it from outside that function, which would be not in this scope. Again, it helps to think of the code inside the function as it in its own little bubble. So that's why if you want to get the data out, you use the return keyword right there. And you also have to specify up here that this function returns some sort of data. And in case it wasn't clear, it's actually each function has its own scope. So let me declare another function here. I'm just going to call it function C um, from within this function. It's got its own scope. So I can't access sum because that's in this functions little bubble. And you can see here that Xcode doesn't know what sum is. And if I declared a variable inside function C, I wouldn't be able to access that from outside that function or from within another function either. So you can think of each function, the code inside of it is in its own little world. And what you do in there is kind of invisible to the outside unless you start returning the data. All right. So let's erase this test function here. And I guess one last thing before we move on is this yellow line is called a warning and Xcode is just trying to optimize things here. It's saying that some, after we assigned something to it, it was never changed again. 
So why don't we use a constant instead of a variable? So we can actually use let instead of var, which is something you learned about a couple of lessons ago. All right, today you learned about how you can organize your code into functions. You learned about function parameters where you can pass data into functions for them to work with. We also covered return values where functions can return data back to us. And finally, we covered variable scope where the variables and data inside of a function only exist within the scope of that function. Believe it or not, there's still more to functions that you can learn about, but what we've covered in this lesson is more than sufficient for what you need right now. If you do wanna learn more about functions right now, I'll add some links into the description to additional videos that I have, as well as the official Apple documentation for functions. And don't forget to download my handy cheat sheet, as well as the lesson worksheet so that you can practice working with functions some more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next lesson. Hi, welcome to lesson seven. In the previous lessons, you learned about some basic Swift code and also how to organize that code into executable blocks called functions. Well, in this lesson, you're gonna learn about how to organize and group those functions together into what's known as a class. Before we go on, I just wanna say something. Learning something new is hard, seriously. I know firsthand because I failed at learning iOS programming myself when I first tried. For coming this far, give yourself a pat on the back, especially if you've never coded before. I know you might be wondering, variables, constants, functions, classes, why the heck do I need to know all of this stuff? Well, by the end of this lesson, and when you start to watch the next, all the pieces will fall into place. We're gonna go back to the Xcode project. I'll point out all of the little pieces to you that we've been learning about in the past three lessons, and you'll have a Eureka moment. So I want you to pay extra attention to this video because it's the last lesson that we're gonna do on Swift before we go back to our Xcode project and finish building that war card game app. All right, here we go. All right, so we're starting with this playground and I've got two functions here. You should be able to read this Swift code and understand what they do. Here's the thing, these functions don't actually do anything, but you can read the function names. One function is supposed to initiate cruising and the other function is supposed to initiate the rocket thrusters. Now, for instance, inside this function, we're supposed to write the code that will initiate the rocket thrusters, essentially to carry out the task set out by this function. And likewise, in here, we are supposed to write the lines of code that will initiate cruising. Now, all of the lines of code that we write in here, they all contribute and they all relate to this task. Well, we can go on to say that these two functions have related responsibilities that serve a higher purpose. For instance, we can group these two functions together into a single class. Let's see how we can declare a new class. I'm going to declare it up here, create some space. We start with the class keyword and then we are going to put the name of the class and I'm going to call the name spaceship and then you hit space and then you open up a pair of curly brackets and inside the pair of curly brackets let's create some space because all of the functions that are related to this class are going to go in there so I'm going to highlight these two functions like this I'm going to press command X on my keyboard to cut it and then I'm going to put my cursor inside the curly brackets of my class and I'm going to press command V to paste these two functions inside my class. When the function is inside of a class like this, it's no longer called a function, it's actually called a method of that class. I know, it's kind of confusing. Check out these diagrams. First we had functions and then we put them inside of a class and now they're called methods. I want to talk about variable scope for a second. In the last lesson, you learned that declaring a variable inside of a function, it only exists within that scope. So for instance, we declared a variable called name in function A. We cannot access that name variable in function B because function B has its own scope. Same goes for the reverse. If we declare a variable in function B, we can't access it within function A because that variable only exists within function B's scope. Now get this, the class actually has its own scope. You can actually declare a variable inside the class that sits outside of any function. This variable exists inside the entire scope of the class. Since function A and function B are also inside the scope of that class, they can both access that variable. When you declare a variable inside the class, but it's outside of any functions, it's called a property of that class. 
Again, I know it's confusing because we're kind of changing the name on you when it's inside of a class, but that's what it's called. So let's see this in action. I'm going to declare a property up here that is inside my spaceship class, but outside of any functions. And I'm going to declare it. I'm going to call it fuel level. And I'm going to go ahead and set that to 100. For instance, inside of the thrust function, we will need to access the fuel level property to determine if we can perform the thrust. So let's just check if we can access that guy. Like that. And let's wait for Xcode to do it. Oh, actually, it's not going to output this because uh, we need to call the thrust function. It's not going to run this code until this function gets called. However, we know that we can access the fuel level property from inside the thrust function. Now, let us try something else here. If I declared a variable inside cruise, let's just call it test equals test from within the thrust function, I can't access that test variable. You're going to see that it uh, throws an error here. So this proves that the scope of the functions remain the same, right? Each block of code inside of the function is in its own little bubble, right? It's in its own little scope. But however, when you declare something outside of the functions, but inside the class, that is available for the entire scope of the class, right? So even in here in cruise, I can access the fuel level property. Let's get rid of that print. Yeah. So there are no errors with the way it is right now. Inside both functions, I can access fuel level because fuel level exists for the entire scope of the class. Let's go ahead and erase these print statements. All right, now we're going to take a giant leap and I'll explain to you how classes are used. It's going to require a little bit of abstract thinking. I just want to say that in my four years of teaching iOS programming, this is one of the hardest concepts, if not the hardest concept for beginners who have never programmed before to understand. However, once you get this concept, you'll have passed a major hump that so many beginners have given up at. I'm done talking. Let's do this. So let's use our analogies here. So we have some data and we have some variables and constants as sticky tabs. Now we have functions that encapsulate these pieces of code. Let's say that functions are like file folders. Now we have classes that contain a bunch of functions and variables. And let's say that the class is like a file box that contains the file folders and the pages. Well, at the end of the day, what we have is just a file box full of instructions. It doesn't actually do anything. Some people think of the class like a recipe. Some people say to think of it like a blueprint. What's the common thing here? They all need someone or something to turn this set of instructions into action. Someone takes the recipe and turns it into a cake. Someone takes the blueprints and builds a spaceship. This spaceship will work exactly like we've designed it to. It can thrust and it can cruise because we gave it functions to do so. But understand that the class itself doesn't thrust or cruise. It's the actual object that gets created from the class that will thrust their cruise. Furthermore, once you have a blueprint, you can make multiple spaceships. Each of them will have its own fuel level and ability to thrust their cruise. The blueprint is called the class and the objects that are created are called objects or instances of the spaceship class. All right. So who is that person that will take that class and turn it into an object? Well, that's the device in your hand. It's like a mini computer. You write your instructions in Xcode. Xcode will turn it into a format that can be understood by your device and your device carries out those instructions. Here's the tricky part. You need to write instructions to tell the computer to take your classes and turn them into objects. And furthermore, you need to write instructions to tell the computer how you want it to use those objects. For example, you write instructions like when the user taps on the lift off button, create an object from the spaceship class, call the thrust function of that object, and then call the cruise function of that object. That could be an app right there. Let's go back to our playground and see how we can write instructions like this. So here we have our spaceship class. That's this whole thing right there. And it's got a property called fuel level and it's got two functions right here. So in order to take this spaceship class and turn it into a spaceship object, this is what you do. 
you call the class by its name like that and then you put in those two rounded brackets and that statement will return a spaceship object to you. Now just like a function returns a value to you, we need to assign this new object to a variable so we can keep track of it. So let's create, maybe we can use a constant this time. Let's create a constant called my ship and then equal and this line right here creates a new spaceship object and we're going to assign that object to the my ship constant. Now remember back in the first Swift Basics lesson, I told you that variables and constants can only be assigned data of a single type? Watch this. I can't do something like my ship equals 10 now, right? Because 10 is an integer. And what did I assign to it first? I assigned to it a spaceship object. Your class is actually also a data type now. So where I could do something like this, you know, var my int is data type of type int, you know, and assign it 10. Here I am specifying that this variable will contain this data type. I could do this. This variable will contain objects or this type. So that's why I cannot assign my ship equals 10 because once I create a spaceship object and assign it to my ship, it can only be assigned spaceship type of objects. And don't forget that this is a constant, so <laughs> I can't even reassign anything to it. But if it were a variable, I could assign a new spaceship object to it. I can create another one and then assign it to my ship, but I cannot start assigning other data types to it. All right, now the next order of business is how do I take that object that this variable is pointing to and then access the fuel level property or call the cruise or thrust function. Let me show you how to do that. So we're going to type in my ship, that's the variable, right? And it's pointing to our spaceship object. And then I'm going to use what's called dot notation. So I'm going to just press dot on my keyboard and then it's going to show me all of the available properties and functions that I could access and call. So for instance, if I chose thrust like this, I would actually be calling the thrust function of this spaceship object. If I did this, my ship dot cruise, I would be calling the cruise function of the spaceship object. And if I did this and I can print it, I would be accessing the fuel level property of this spaceship object. Now I can actually also set it so I can do dot fuel level equals 10. And then when I do that, the new fuel level will be 10 and you can see that it prints it out here. It's going to be 10. So using dot notation, you can access the methods and properties of that object. I like to think that coding an app is like writing a script for a movie. The movie script is your app code. The character roles are the classes you designed, but the character roles themselves, they don't do anything. Those roles need to be filled by physical actors and actresses, just like we need to turn classes into objects. Then the actors and actresses follow the script to perform your movie, just like how your objects work together to make your app function. All right, so all of that was pretty abstract, but in the next lesson, we're going to put all of it into practice. Let's recap what we've learned. You've learned about classes and how they contain methods and properties. You learn that classes don't actually do anything themselves. They need to be turned into objects first. These objects are also called instances of that class. You learned how to create an instance of a class. You learned about the dot notation and how it can be used to access the methods and properties of a class. You also learned about the variable scope within a class itself. If you need to, rewatch this video and ask any questions you might have in the comment section below. I also have a worksheet for you to practice what you've learned today. In the next lesson, you're going to start bringing your app to life with your newly minted Swift skills. If you're excited like I am, type I'm pumped in the comment section below. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel by hitting the subscribe button below. And if you don't want to miss a video, make sure you click that bell icon as well. Remember, you can download this lesson's worksheet from the URL that's on the screen or in the link in the description below. Hi, welcome to lesson eight. You're almost there. Only three lessons to go. In this video, I'll show you how those Swift basics you've been learning about apply and relate to our Xcode project. By the end of this video, you'll learn how to write code in the view controller to manage and access the elements in the storyboard.
I'm also going to show you what to do when your app crashes, which happens more often than you think. All right, let's do it. Right here, we have the Xcode project that we started back in lesson four. Well, we're going to continue working on it right now. Let's jump into viewcontroller.swift where I'm going to point out a couple of things to you based on what we've covered in the previous couple of Swift lessons. Starting from line nine, we've got import UI kit. Now you definitely know what that is because you've seen it in the playground. UIKit is a library of code that's provided by Apple and the import statement is basically saying to use it. Now on line 11, we've got class view controller. That is a class. Your view controller is a class and you can see this is the starting uh, curly bracket for it and this is the ending curly bracket. So all of this stuff inside is part of the class. There are some things that I'm going to gloss over right now because you will learn about it in the future and I don't want to confuse you now. And one of those things is this, this colon UI view controller part. It's something called subclassing, which allows you to build your class off of a pre-existing class rather than starting from scratch. But we're not going to talk about subclassing in this lesson. Just kind of keep in mind that that's what this part of the code does. Basically, view controller is a class that builds off of the UI view controller class. And down here, you have some functions. Now, there is an override keyword before the FUNC, but uh, ignore that for now. It has to do with subclassing. And so here's your function. It's called view did load. And then you've got an opening curly bracket and a closing one. And then the code inside here is the code for your function. Super is another keyword that has to do with subclassing. So we're going to ignore that for now. And same thing goes for this function did receive memory warning. Okay. So this is another function. Isn't this cool? This was stuff that you were learning about in the past couple of Swift lessons. And now we can relate it directly back to our Xcode project. So your view controller is a class. That means for it to do anything, the view controller has to be turned into an object, right? So, Let's go into the main.storyboard and I'll show you something else that will blow your mind. Look at all of these elements that we added to the view. Are those objects? Are those classes? What are those things that we are adding and customizing to this view? Believe it or not, we're actually creating objects when we drag these elements onto the view. Well, you might ask, objects come from classes, right? What sorts of classes do these elements come from? Well, all of these elements in the object library down here in the lower right hand corner, these are actually classes in UIKit. Stuff like this label, this button, you know, text fields and stuff like that. These are all classes. And so now this name object library is a little more significant to you, right? That's right. UIKit is actually a library of classes that Apple provides and it contains useful classes such as buttons, labels, image views, all the stuff that you've been using and a lot more. For instance, by dragging and dropping this UI image view here, I'm actually creating an object of this class. Click it and check out the stuff in the inspector pane. All of these things that I can configure, they are properties of the UI image view class. You see, the interface builder here is simply a visual way to make it easier for us. Everything we're doing here in the storyboard, we can actually do through code. In fact, we can completely omit using the storyboard and instead write code inside of the view controller here to create all of the objects, set their properties, and then place them into the view. However, that is definitely more of an intermediate to advanced thing that you'll eventually get to. For beginners who are just starting out, I highly recommend using the storyboard. So if these elements in the view here are objects, how can I get access to them from the view controller? That's where IB outlet properties come into play. Let me show you how to expose these elements from the storyboard to the view controller as an IB outlet property. Now there are multiple ways of doing it, but the easiest way is just to select the view controller here in the document outline to make sure that you have it highlighted and then go over here in the upper right hand corner and click on this little icon that looks like two interjoining circles. This is what's known as the assistant editor and it basically kind of splits your screen into two. So on the left hand side you can view your storyboard and then on the right hand side you can view the code. Now I want you to go over here to this little breadcrumb navigation and make sure that uh, where my mouse is hovering yours also says automatic. If it doesn't just go ahead and click it and then scroll down to automatic here. Um, 
you should see viewcontroller.swift if you've got it highlighted here. Because basically the automatic setting will show what's relevant on the right hand side according to what you select on the left hand side. So if you've got the view controller selected, this automatic setting should be showing you viewcontroller.swift. The reason is because this view controller here, this node in the document outline is actually the visual representation or you could call it the object of this view controller class here. Now what I want you to do is on the right hand side in the view controller, right underneath class, like inside the class but above the view did load function, just press enter a couple of times on your keyboard to create a little bit of space and make sure you don't do it here but you do it here, right? Inside the class, right after that starting uh, curly bracket for the class. So right here, create some space. And then on the left hand side in the document outline, click on this first card. This is the left card right here. And you can see that being highlighted. If I click this one, you're gonna see the right card being highlighted. So go ahead, let's click the left one. We'll start with that. And now hold down control on your keyboard. And while still holding that down, click this image view in the document outline and start moving your mouse and dragging it. You're going to see a blue line follow your mouse as long as you're holding down that control button and you haven't let go of the mouse yet. So drag it over here on the right hand side where we created that space and you should see that little note saying insert outlet or outlet collection and now you can let go of your mouse and you can let go of control and out pops this little menu here and you can see that the connection type is set to outlet and the object is view controller and we're going to name our IB outlet property now. You can ignore the rest here. Well, the type should be UI image view. You shouldn't need to change this. If you selected the right element here, you should automatically have this type as UI image view. Okay, so here I'm going to call it the left image view like that and I'm going to click this connect button. So there we have it it automatically generates this property for us. Now this property is special in that it has this special keyword here, IB outlet, and you can see that var keyword there, and maybe I should just minimize that pane so we have a little more space, and uh, you can see this is the name that I gave the property, and this is the data type right, that the property is going to hold. There are a couple of things that we're going to ignore right now. I'll explain it down the road. That is this week in this exclamation mark. You don't have to worry about that for now. But what you should know is that what we've just done is we've connected this element here, this left card view, um, it, to this IBL property here so that this property will actually point to this UI image view object. And since we have a reference to that object, we can use dot notation, like you learned in the previous lesson, to access all of the methods and properties of that UI image view object, right? So if we wanted to change that image, we could call functions on it, we could you know, set its properties, and we can do that. I'll show you that in a second, but right now, I just want to go over some common mistakes. We wanna double check that we've connected it right. So what I want you to do is go back here on the left hand side the storyboard and then right click your left image view you can see that it even changed its name here you can either right click it in the document outline here or right click it in the storyboard either way it should pop up this little uh, context menu for that element and under referencing outlets you should see the property name which is left image view followed by view controller this is the object which contains that property. This shows you that this element is connected as an outlet property to this class right here. And it also gives you this little X button for you to break that connection. If you don't see this, that means that you might have connected the wrong element. So let me show you how to fix that. What you're going to do first is you need to find out which element you accidentally connected. So what I would do is I would go right click this guy and then check, you know, right right click a couple of elements which you think you might have dragged. It could be potentially this card stack view, right? Because if you're clicking this, you might have accidentally selected the stack view instead. You know, so sometimes it's just easier to connect it from the document outline rather than clicking it from here. But anyways, after you find out the one that you accidentally connected, go ahead and click X to break the connection and then go back to the view controller here 
and then delete that IBA outlet property. And now you can start from scratch again, essentially. So again, let's do it one more time for practice. On the left-hand side here, I have selected the left UI image view. Hold down control on the keyboard, click and drag over here, I let go. And then I can now name my outlet left image view. And I'm going to click connect. Now, another mistake that sometimes happens is that you made a typo while you named that outlet property. So some people might just go ahead and correct it. Let's say they, they forgot to capitalize something and they might just change it here. I'm just going to, maybe I'm going to add a letter like that. Let's pretend I am correcting a typo. But if you do this, things will break. Let's go back to the left hand side and right click that UI image view. You can see here that the referencing outlet, it's connected to left image view, right? But I've just changed that property name to left image views. So when you run your app, it's going to be looking for that property to assign the object to. It's not going to find that property and it's going to break. So if you made a typo, don't just erase it or correct it here. You will actually have to just go ahead and delete it and then go back here on the left hand side, right click, click this X to break the connection first and then do it all over again. So hold down control, click and drag it here, left image view, connect. All right, let's connect the other image view. So I'm going to click on this one, hold down control, click and drag it here. Make sure you don't drag it into this existing outlet. You can see here it highlights the outlet in blue. You don't want to do that. Otherwise, you're going to have connected two outlets to the same property and bad things can happen. So uh, just make some space if you need to and connect it down here. I'm going to call this the right image view, just like that. And you'll actually notice that this gray circle is filled in. It's if you hover over it, it tells you what it's connected to, see? And when it's filled in, that means it's connected. Let me just show you here. I'm gonna break the connection in the storyboard here. Now you can actually see that it has turned um, hollow. And that means that this property isn't connected to anything. Now, I find that this is not the most reliable way to tell because sometimes when you just open your Xcode project, it doesn't really update these little circles. So there are times when I know they are connected, but they still show hollow. So I wouldn't put too much emphasis on using this. Um, but anyways, here's another way to connect your outlet. If you already have the uh, property here, you can right click here, new referencing outlet. You can, uh, this little circle here, you can actually click this plus icon and you can, you know, let's drag it to the view controller node here, let go, and you can actually select the property. Make sure you select the correct one though, right image view. And now you can see that this is filled in. And when you hover over it, it should highlight the right image view. But you know, I wouldn't attempt to do it the way I just showed you. If you're not comfortable with things yet, just connect it using the control click and drag method. That's the uh, easiest way for beginners to learn, I feel. So now go back down here under the stack view. We are also going to connect the labels. So there are two labels that we want to connect this a zero under player. So hold down control, click and drag down here. I'm going to call this the left score label. And for this one, click drag, or hold down control as well. I forgot to mention uh, right score. Now, before I connect this one, I'm going to purposely make a typo. Let's call it right score labels like that. And when I connect it, I've noticed, oh man, I made a typo. So I am going to actually just correct it like this. You can actually see when I did that, this became disconnected. And if I right click my label here, it's still connected to right score labels, but I don't have that property. And I'm going to run it for you right now and show you what happens. So it's going to crash and because we have assistant editor open, both the panes change to here, but it's going to highlight this red line here, which doesn't really tell us much. What you want to do actually is go down to the lower right hand corner into this console area where there's a lot of gibberish, but this is essentially where you can find the detailed error message. It, the last line tells you terminating with uncaught exception of type NS exception. That's basically just 
telling you that the app crashed. What you should do is you should scroll all the way up. All the way up to the top usually. And you're going to find actually a more detailed error message. More plain English that you can read. The stuff here, blah, 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 blah. And then down here, this class is not key value coding compliant for the key write score labels. Now, this line might not make any sense to you. This class is not key value coding compliant for the key. But however, over time, when you see the same message over and over again, you kind of learn to understand what the cause of that is. And in this case, it's because it's trying to look for write score labels. But however, we don't have that property. You know, this is a heck of a lot more easy to understand than you know, reading any of this. And this is just a generic message which doesn't tell you what's wrong. So in this console area, you scroll all the way up and then you read what the error message is. So let's go back to the storyboard and let's fix this error and resolve this crash. So we're gonna click on the storyboard. The left hand side changes of our assistant editor and on the right hand side, you should see the view controller. If you don't uh, click on the view controller up here, make sure that this side is set to automatic like that and we're gonna fix this right score label so this one this is connected to an outlet that doesn't exist anymore so go ahead and click x and then we are going to take this new referencing outlet and connect it to a pre-existing one and that's right score label and so now this guy's filled in if i hover over this circle you'll see that this right score label is highlighted so we know which one it's connected to Okay, so now we've got four IB outlet properties and they are connected to uh, these objects that are on our storyboard. And since these properties are outside of any functions and they're inside our class, we can actually access them from inside any function. So let's just do a little test here in view did load. For example, I can say left image view, right? That's our property name up here, dot. And then these are all of the properties and functions that are available for a UI image view uh, object. And I can access this property called image, right? And then I can go ahead and I can set that and change the image. We're not going to do that right now. We're going to do this in the next lesson. But for now, I just wanted to show you that we can access this image view here and we can access the image property using dot notation like that. So let's go ahead and delete that. So you know the image property that I just showed you? Let's click this button to go back to the single view editor and let's click this button to get our inspector pane back. If I click this image view, see right here in the inspector pane, this image drop down here? Well, that is the image property that I just accessed in the view controller, right? So if I set that with code, that's the equivalent of setting it here. To one of these image assets. See, I can choose card 14, choose whatever, and simply by connecting this element as an IB outlet property to the view controller, the view controller now can write code to manage this element in the storyboard. Okay, so now the next order of business is how do we run some specific block of code or a function when the deal button is tapped here. Because essentially, when this button is tapped, we want to run code that will change these images, right? Well, we can use something called an IB action function. So very similar to IB outlet property, but this one is a function. So let me show you how to connect that. We are going to go back to assistant editor. So let's hit view controller on the right hand side. It should be set to automatic view controller. and we were connecting the outlets up here because that's where properties go inside the class. But now for a function, we only have to put it inside of the class, right? So this last curly bracket, this one is the ending curly bracket for the class. So we want to put our function inside of the class, right? So you have to make sure that you create some space before this last curly bracket, right? This curly bracket is for this function. And so right here would be a good place to put the function uh, to run when the deal button is tapped. Now we don't have to write the function. All we have to do is go over here on the left hand side and click on the button element from the document outline. Hold down control on your keyboard, click and drag all the way here and then let go of your mouse button 
and out pops this little guy. But before you connect it, change the connection type to IB action instead. Okay, and the object is view controller, the name, I'm going to call it deal tapped. And the you can leave the rest of it as is. The event is touch up inside. Now, touch up inside is basically the event when the user taps on the button and lets go of the finger while still within the button. Right? This is essentially tapping of the button. Uh, there's also other ones. If you click it, there's like touch drag outside, touch drag inside. There's touch up outside, which is actually when the user taps on the button but slides their finger off the button and then lets go. So that doesn't count as a tap, and we don't want that. This is the one we want, touch up inside. Let's click connect. And now you can see that it actually connected a function, see F-U-N-C, and the function name is deal tapped, and inside it's got a parameter. Uh, you don't have to worry about what that is, but it's essentially the button that triggered that event. So in between these two curly brackets, that's where we write the code for our function. Hit enter a couple of times, and in here I'm just going to print out a statement so we can test it out. I'm going to say deal like that. And in the next lesson, we'll actually put some real code in there. But this looks like an IB outlet property, except it's a function. You can see this keyword here, IB action. And you can see this, if I hover over this, it goes over the button. Now in terms of troubleshooting, similar to IB outlet properties, if you accidentally made a typo or something like that, or you might have connected the wrong element, simply go ahead, let's delete this IB action altogether. Let's right click that button and you're going to see all of these events under the touch up inside it's connected to the view controller deal tapped but i just erased that function so it doesn't exist click this x to break that connection and let's go ahead and do it again so i'm going to hold down control drag the button let go there and i am actually going to Oh, don't forget to change the connection type to action. I oftentimes forget to do that. And let's call it deal. I'm going to accidentally mistype it again. So deal taps. Okay, I'm going to connect it and then realize, oh no, I made a typo. And then I go ahead and uh, correct it here. But notice now it's not connected to anything, right? The button here, it's connected to deal taps, which I just got rid of. Now I only have deal tapped. So if you make a mistake like that, break the connection, and you can actually touch up inside, move to the right, and this this is a little prone to error actually because you might be hovering over the wrong circle. So if you just move your mouse over here, click and drag it to the view controller here, and you can select an IB action function, and then you can see it connected, right? Or if you don't want to do it that way, just you know, delete this, break the connection, and then use the control drag method and reconnect it. Oh, but anyways, let's test out this function here. So let's use print, let's use deal like that, and let's run our app again. Now, if you don't see this and it crashes or something like that, then you know you've probably made a mistake connecting your outlets. So go through the troubleshooting steps that we've gone through in this video. Now clicking the deal button, we should see something pop up in the console. So you can see, see each time we hit deal, this function is being fired and it's printing deal into the console. All right, so in this lesson, you learned about IB outlet properties and how they can be used to expose the elements in the storyboard to the view controller. You also learned about IB action functions, which let you write code in response to events from the storyboard. You learned how to correct any mistakes you might have made when connecting IB outlet properties or IB action functions. And finally, when your app crashes, you learned about how to find that detailed error message, which is so crucial to understanding why your app is crashing. There's no worksheet for this lesson, but I highly recommend that you replicate what we've done in this video in your own Xcode project. And if your app is crashing, remember to go through those steps that we covered in this video. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel by hitting the subscribe button below. If you don't want to miss a single video, make sure you click that bell icon as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next lesson. Hi, welcome to lesson nine. This is a fun lesson. Today in this video, we're going to make the card images change as you tap on that deal button. Let's jump right in. So here we've got our Xcode project. The first thing we're going to do is try to change these images through code. Click on this UI image view 
and then in the inspector panel you can see here this is the image property and in the drop down we can simply select let's say card 10 All right for that one and let's click on this guy and let's change that to card 13 so we've got a 10 and a king this one's got its image property set to card 13 and this one here the left one has got its image property set to card 10 now let's set them back to the back because we're going to try to do what we just did through code. Let's jump into our view controller and let's go down here to the deal tapped function. This fires when the deal button is tapped. We're going to erase that uh, line that printed out the deal text in the console. And so we've got an empty function and let's just scroll up a little bit to remind ourselves that the left image view is connected to this property and the right image view is connected to this property. All right, you can see that this property is type of UI image view and this property is also a type of UI image view. So let's go down here and let's type left image view in order to access that object that we have in the storyboard and let us use dot notation to access the image property. Now you can see that on the left hand side here it says UI image. Don't mistake this for a UI image view, which is what we have here. A UI image represents an image, okay? And the UI image view, which is what we have, you know, up here, the left image view and the right image view, these are used to display UI images. So going back here, let me show you that autocomplete menu again. Let's delete that and hit dot and then tap image. You can see here the description for this property says the image displayed in the image view. So what we have to do is actually we have to assign a UI image object to this image property because this left hand side tells us what data type that this property expects. So let's go ahead and choose that and we are going to hit equals and now we are going to create a new UI image object. Now UI image is also a class from the UI kit. We're going to do this UI and make sure you're typing, you know, capital U, capital I, and then capital I, and then all lower cases M A G E. It's actually, it, it makes a difference. It matters. Same thing for here. This image property is a lowercase I. So uh, when you're following me typing out this code, you got, kind of have to type it out uh, letter for letter. And also another mistake I've seen before is make sure you have spaces before and after your equal signs. You know, something like that is not the same thing. All right, so go like that. And then uh, in order to create a new object of that class, remember you use the rounded brackets like that. So here we are creating a UI image object and we are assigning it to the image property of the left image view. So it's going to display this UI image, but you know what? this UI image is empty. It, we haven't specified what image we want to show from the asset library, right? In our asset library, we've got all of these great card images. So back in the view controller here, the UI image class actually has a way for us to, when we create that object, pass in that image that we want the UI image to represent as a data input. So let me show you what that is. I'm going to open up the left bracket. You can see here, you could just create a UI image object with a set of brackets like that. Or you can choose one of these functions that lets you pass in a data input and which returns a UI image object representing that data input. Let's scroll all the way down to this one here, named and you get to pass in a string representing the asset name that you want this UI image to represent. So go ahead and select that, and then you're gonna pass in a string, right? Let's put card 10. Now, this actually also has to be exact. If you go into your asset library, if this says card 10 with a lowercase c, with no space in between the D and the one, you know, word for word, letter for letter, character for character, you have to use that exact same asset name here. Otherwise, it's not going to find it. So this line, basically, you are accessing the left image view on the storyboard. You are accessing its 
image property and then here you are creating a UI image object using a special function that lets you specify the asset name that you want that UI image to represent and then we are assigning that object to the image property and that's actually going to do the trick so if we run our project right now you are not going to see it because we haven't tapped on the deal button yet but as soon as we tap on this deal button it's going to run this deal tapped function and it's going to change see if this looks like an empty space for you that means you might have either made a typo in the asset name here or you might not actually even have the asset in your asset library here so double check those two things now we're going to also change the right card so go ahead and do right image view dot image equals UI image open that up you can use autocomplete go all the way down named like that and then we'll pass in card 13 and let's press command R to run the project or you can just tap on that little play icon up there and let's tap on the deal button and then you're going to see that happen if I tap on it again nothing's going to change because our code just sets these two image views to these two specific images now the next thing we have to worry about is how do we randomize it when we tap on this deal button well in order to do that we're gonna to have to learn how to generate some random numbers so let's go down here and let's generate a random number we're gonna store it into a constant let's say uh, left random number equals and there's a special function that we use it's called arc for random and as you start typing ARC it should actually pop up and you're not going to use arc for random you're going to scroll down a little bit you're going to use arc for random underscore uniform it's going to let you specify an upper bound for you to randomize on and so we have cards number let's go back to our asset library here cards number two all the way up to 14 however we can only specify an upper limit for that arc for random underscore uniform function so that function is actually going to randomize an integer from zero all the way up to the limit that you specify minus one meaning that if you pass in an upper limit of 15 it's going to randomize a number from zero to 14 and if we get zero or one we don't have cards zero to one and so we only have starting from two uh, so I want to randomize from zero to 12 and then add two to the result which is going to give us the same thing so in order to randomize all the way up to 12 we have to pass in an upper limit of 13 because that's how um, this function works here uh, when you specify an upper bound let's say we put in 13 it's going to go from 0 to 12 and then what we're going to do is we're going to add 2 to that result um, and this is going to give us 2 to 14 which is exactly what we have in terms of the card names and now I think you're getting an idea of how we're going to do this randomization so what I'm going to do is actually randomize two numbers so let write random number equals arc for random uniform and we are actually going to do the same thing for the right side we just want a different random number and we're going to print this out so let's try it out print left random number is and then remember we learned how to substitute variables into strings backslash pair of rounded brackets and then we put the variable name so left random number and then after we randomize the right one let's also print that out right random number is make sure you put right random number this time all right and now let's press command R and rerun our app all right and now we're going to click the deal button and we should see the random numbers printed out in the console all right so we've got 9 and 11 2 and 5 9 and 14 and uh, 13 and 11 and we can keep going and I just want to make sure that we don't see any zero ones or anything beyond 14 because we don't have those cards all right so we can generate random numbers just like that and now going back to the Xcode project 
Here's a neat trick. If you want to stop a line of code from running, but you're not sure if you might need it soon, you can actually just put two forward slashes and treat it as a comment, just like that. And that line of code is now treated as a note or a remark, so it's not going to be run as code. And then later when you need it, you can just erase those two forward slashes like that, and then you know you still have it. But I want to warn you against doing this too much because it can get pretty messy if you just leave commented out code everywhere. So only use this uh, in a very temporary sense because not only can you comment out a line like this, but you can actually comment out a whole chunk of code or a section of code. If you do forward slash star, you can see how everything turns green beneath it. And where you want it to end, you go star forward slash like that. So everything in between these two symbols is going to be treated as a comment. So that's how you comment out entire chunks of code. Um, let's delete that. All right, so now I think you can see how we are going to combine this random number with setting the image, right? We actually just did it up here. We're gonna use variable substitution. So instead of card 10, let's erase that slash and then open up a pair of brackets and then here put left random number. And then down here, instead of 13, let's erase that slash, open up a pair of rounded brackets and put the right one. All right, and now we can actually just run our project. Press Command R. And you can see that the random numbers are being basically combined with card to generate our asset name so that's why the cards are named as they are here like this now if you're clicking through these cards and some of the times you see a, an empty card or a blank card um, that probably means that one of your assets might be named incorrectly because the reason why it would be blank is because it can't find that asset name in this lesson, you learned how to change the image of a UI image view through code. You learned how to randomize numbers and insert variables into strings. I can't stop tapping the deal button. In the next lesson, you're gonna learn how to update the labels and count score. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel by hitting the subscribe button below. And if you don't wanna miss a single video, make sure you tap on that bell icon as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next lesson. Hi, welcome to lesson 10. By the end of this video, you will have completed the War Card Game project. All that's left to do is to count score and update the labels. In order to do that though, we need to write Swift code that can compare two numbers and then execute a different branch of code depending on the outcome. In other words, you're going to be writing Swift code that can make its own decisions. That's step one if you want to build a Terminator. All right, let's get this show on the road. So here I've got a playground and the only thing I have right now is a constant called x and I've set it to equal to 10. And now I'm going to show you how to write what's called an if statement. And this if statement lets us test conditions and if the condition that we're testing is true, then we can choose to run some code. And this is how we are going to actually compare the two numbers in our war card game project when we randomize those two numbers. So let me show you how to write this if statement. We start off with the keyword if and then we do space, and then we write our uh, condition or expression here. And in this case, I'm gonna test this condition, is x greater than 14? And if that is true, then I want to run the following code. We open up a code block with a pair of curly brackets, and then inside here, let's just print hello. So I'm just gonna put a comment here. Um, this code will run if x is greater than 14. Since x is actually 10 and this is not true, it's not going to run this statement here. It's not going to run any of the code in here. I can put lots of code statements in here if I wanted to. Now let's change x to 15. In this case, this becomes true and then it's going to run the code inside the if statement and therefore we see this hello statement down here. Now the cool thing is that I can actually expand my if statement into multiple branches. I can test many things if I wanted to. 
And the way we do that is this first test we use if. The second test we use else space if, and then I can test another condition. I can say is x less than 10, right? If that's the case, then let's print, uh, I don't know, let's just print a, and then I can go on and I can test something else is x. Uh, let's do equal to, and it open up another code block if that is true. Now here's the interesting thing I want to show you. If x is equal to 12, I don't use the single equal sign. I use a double equal sign, and this is to test equality. Why is this the case? Well, because the single equal sign is used for assignment. You learned this back in the first Swift lesson where we talked about variables and constants. This equal sign is to use to assign this data on the right hand side to the variable or to the constant. So if I use the single equal sign here, Xcode will actually think we are assigning this to that when we actually want to compare. So you use the double equal sign to test for equality. All right, so in this case, I'm gonna just print B. So far, we've said that you can test a single condition and then you can test other conditions after that. And there is actually a last part to the if statement, which is the else keyword. And there is no if in this case. This is kind of like the last resort. If none of these conditions up here are true, then this, this is kind of like your catch all. Let's open up a code block and let's just print C in here. So this entire thing is your if statement. Let's talk about how this code is going to be run. So when it comes here, it's going to test the statement is X greater than 14. And if it is, it's going to come into this. This is called a branch of the if statement. And it's going to execute this line and it's going to skip everything else because in the entire if statement, it's only going to choose one branch to go into. So in here, this is true. So it comes into this branch and it's going to skip the rest. How about if we change X to nine? Now A is printed. So what's happening here? Well, it's going to test this condition first and that's false. So then it's going to test the next one. And in this case, it's true. So then it's going to come into here and it's going to skip the rest. Now let's change X to 12 and you kind of get the idea, right? It tests this one false. It'll test the next one. That's false. Then it'll test the next one. And this is true. So it's going to come in here and it's going to skip this guy. Now, if I just made, uh, let's see, 13 would be, I guess the sweet spot here. And we get C because it's going to test these conditions. All of them evaluate to false. And then it's going to come down here. And this is kind of the last resort where if none of this is true, then it's going to come into this branch of code. I want to point out that you can actually just omit the else if you wanted to. And if you did that, nothing would happen because it would check all of these conditions. All of them are false. So it's not going to do any of it. And furthermore, you can have more else if branches if you want, or you could just have one or you can simply have none and just a simple single branch if statement. Let me just hit undo here. I want to point out something else here. And that is that this whole thing is a single if statement. I know I've said this before, but I want to tell you what the implications of that are. It means that only a single branch of this if statement is going to be executed, right? It's going to go into the first one that is true. Or since we have an else clause, it's going to come into this last branch. This is different than if I had done something like this. If I had done something like this, these are separate if statements. This is a single if statement. This is another if statement. And lastly, this is the third if statement. So that means in this case, I could have multiple things printed. So let me change uh, this to that. And if I had this as, let's say 15, right? You can see hello is printed. You can see A is printed and you can see that C is also printed, right? And the reason for this is because this is a single if statement. It's going to test this. If it's true, then it's going to print this. Now onto the second if statement, this is true. So that's going to print this third if statement. It's going to test this. That's false. Then it's going to come into the else branch, right? This is very different than if I had 
made these branches of my first if statement. Now, this is a single if statement. It's only going to choose one branch to go into. It's going to test each of these conditions and go into the first one that is true, in this case, this one, and it's going to skip the rest. So I just want to make that distinction to you. And the last thing I just want to say about if statements before we move on is that testing these conditions can actually get pretty complex because there are things called Boolean operators where you can chain multiple conditions together. So I'm just going to do a very quick example. This isn't something that we're going to need for our war card game project, but um, you know, good to know this stuff. So for example, I can test if X is greater than 14 and Y is equal to 10. I use a double ampersand symbol like that space, and then I can test that. So this is going to do two tests and they both have to be true in order for it to come into this branch because it's an end. Okay. And you can actually chain a whole bunch of these together. Now I want to show you or, and that is these two double pipes. On my keyboard, I have to hold down shift and hit the backslash key in order to get these symbols here. This is the or operator. That means that if this is true or this is true, then it will come into here. Only one of these two conditions needs to be true. You know, one can be false. For example, uh, let's say I change X to 10, right? This is false. However, this is true. And since it's an or, it will still come into here and print hello. However, if this is and and clause, then they both have to be true. You can see down here, it actually comes down to print C down here. Okay, so that's the and and or, and you can chain multiple uh, statements together. And actually, let me show you one more thing. So this is equality if Y is equal to 10. Right. If you want to test inequality, you use that exclamation mark equals, and that is going to say if y is not equal to 10. And just to whet your appetite a little bit and show you some more things that you can do with if statements, you can even include these brackets. So you can say something like if this and this are true, or you know x plus y is greater than 29 or something like that. So in this or statement, either this is true or either this is true and that's what those uh, brackets allow you to do kind of like group things together or if we had another thing that's like a string like that you can do tests like if z is equal to test then we could print hello or you know you can do not equal to test and you can actually even do greater than um, but in this case, it's kind of weird to say if it's greater than or less than a, but essentially it doesn't care about the string length. So even though test is four characters and this is only one character, it basically tests character by character. If this is greater than a, then it's going to be considered true. You know, and if we had, um, two letters like that, it would also, it would basically test this letter against this letter. And then E is considered greater than A, right? So this would be true when it come down here. But I don't usually see this happening a lot using <laughs> equality symbol, using greater than or less than with strings. But I just wanted to show you that that was possible. All right, so now we're gonna go back into our war card game project and use if statements to compare the scores. So we're gonna first go into the view controller dot swift and when deal tapped in here um, we are randomizing two numbers right the left random number and the right random number and then we are setting the images in fact we should probably write some comments so i think we can get rid of this print statement here let's get rid of these print statements and down here i'm going to write um, randomize two numbers change the image views and down here we are going to compare the numbers right so I can say if the left random number is greater than the right random number and then we open up a pair of curly brackets right in this case the left side has one because it's got the bigger number and I'm gonna 
do here else if right random number is greater than the left random number then do this and then for the last clause there's only one more possibility right and that is if they are equal so I can either you know just use an else statement like that or you can just do you know if left random number is equal to right random number if you want to be a little clear you can do that as well so there are three different cases so in order to keep a score we actually need a counter of some sort so we're gonna go all the way up here and we are going to write uh, two properties to keep track of the scores so let us write a left score we're gonna just set that to zero and we are also going to do a right score also equal to zero and let's scroll all the way back down here so if the left random number is greater than the right random number then we're going to increase this uh, the left score so you can either do left score equals left score plus one or you can actually do a shorthand way and that is to use the symbol plus equals and that just means to increment so we're going to increment whatever left score is by one all right, we're going to do the same thing here. If the right random number is greater than the left number, then we are going to do the right score plus equal one. And if you want to decrement, you can actually do minus equal. Just a quick note. All right, so here, update the score. Now update the label to reflect that new score. And we have an IB outlet property for that left score label. Right, we s connected it before, so we can do left score label, and the label has actually got a text property. And you've said it before. Let's go to the storyboard. Let me click this label. You can see here in the inspector panel, there is this text property right here. All right, so we can use dot notation, start typing text, and it expects a string. All right, so we can try to assign it this left score which is an integer and you can see what happens right and Xcode is going to complain cannot assign value of int to a type of string so we need to somehow convert this int data to a string data right we need to represent that number in the form of a string so you can actually create a new string object and pass in an integer to create a string version of that integer and you do it like this okay so we're going to do the same thing here update the score update the label and make sure you are incrementing the correct score right here we are incrementing the left score and updating the left score label here we're going to update the right score and update the right score label dot text equals a new string and in this string object we are going to initialize it with the right score and let us run our project and see how that looks for a tie I'm not sure what we want to do there so I'm just gonna actually leave that empty So 10 is greater than 6, so we have this updated. This is greater than 5, so we have this is 2 now. It looks like the player is winning all the time. And there we go. CPU gets 1 on the scoreboard. 10 is greater than 5. All right, pretty cool, right? Now the last part is how do we get this app onto our device? So what you're going to do is you're actually going to plug your device into your computer. And then if you go back to Xcode here and you pull down this where you select the simulator and you go all the way up here, you're going to see this menu. No, well, mine says no device is connected to my Mac because I don't actually have a phone there. But if you have connected your phone or your iPad here, uh, you're going to see that device appear here and then you just want to select it. Um, so this is what I get because I don't have a device but when you select it um, it should have your device selected and then all you need to do is hit the run button and you're gonna run that app on your device and even after you disconnect your device you'll still have that app on your phone and 
you also might get a prompt if it's the first time you're using your device with Xcode, you might get um, a little pop-up asking if you want to use this device for development, then you just say yes and off you go. Not bad, right? Look at how far you've come. Seriously, give yourself a pat on the back. If you finish this project, I want you to go to the lesson page, scroll down and click on that tweet button to let me know. I love hearing from people who have completed this project and I'll also put your name on the wall of fame that is exclusively for people who have finished this project. And if you haven't gotten this project to work yet, remember you can always download my Xcode project and compare it against your own. Also, don't be afraid to ask for help. Just leave a comment below. In the next lesson, I'll show you where to go from here and what to learn next. All right, see you there.